The only people who don't want to disclose the truth are people with something to hide. And now, a man who campaigned against Barack Obama in all 57 states, Mark Galar. Welcome to the Tea Party Power Hour. My name is Mark Galar, and today we're going to be talking to a number of experts on the birth certificate issue. We ask you to stand by for just a moment as we connect to Jerome Corsi. Dr. Corsi? Yeah, I'm right here. Can you hear me? I can. Mark Galar with the Tea Party Power Hour. Welcome to the show today. Uh, we'd like to ask we would like to ask you a few questions about your continued efforts to expose Barack Obama's birth certificate as a complete fraud. Uh, I think I've had you on the show something like uh, three times already in the last year and a half, so welcome back. Thank you. It's great to be back with you. Now, we are, we are going to have a team of experts on in just a few minutes who are Adobe experts, uh, scanner experts, uh, you know, engineers, you name it. And they're going to be discussing from A to Z what's wrong with the document from a computer standpoint. But what I would like to do is I would like to go over a few things with you that I think fall into the common sense category, if we could. Now, one of the first things that jumps out at one who looks into this is that the serial number on the document is wrong. Is that correct? Uh, that's right. I've been reporting on that for some time. I mean, the, if you take a look at the number on the Obama birth certificate, it's 10641. And uh, the Obama birth certificate was registered, I believe, like on August 8, 1961. Uh, the Nordyke twins were born the next day, and their birth certificates were registered on August 11, three days after Obama's. Yet their birth certificate numbers are 10637 and 10638. That's just not possible. The um, the way it worked in Hawaii, and I even got an article written in 1955 by Charles Bennett, who was the registrar who created the system in Hawaii for registering births. Once the birth was registered, it was immediately stamped with this bait stamp that advanced one automatically every time you used it. So, you know, clear indication of forgery. The forgers picked the wrong number. If Obama's birth certificate was registered earlier than the Nordite twins, it had to have a lower number. Instead, it's got a higher number. Now, some people are going to say that that was just a clerical error made by an apathetic, low-level uh, Hawaiian, Hawaiian uh, bureaucrat. What are your thoughts on that? Well, when you read uh, Charles Bennett's memo, the point that he stressed was that Hawaii in 1961 was you know, working its way into the federal government system of vital records, and Hawaii wanted to be uh, included in the U.S. Census uh, data for vital statistics, because, of course, there's a lot of money that comes to the states depending upon births, deaths, and other records being accurate. So Hawaii created a system to be accurate. You know, the idea that there's a pile of birth certificates lying around and they just occasionally stamp them whenever they wanted to isn't the way it was done. Uh, Bennett reduced the number of registrars from something like 35 in all the islands down to about five. He streamlined the system. He demanded efficiency. It's just not credible to say that Obama's birth certificate got a higher um, number, even though it was registered earlier, simply because somebody made a mistake. And by the way, those bait stamps didn't go backwards very easily. You had to mechanically move the dials back in order to get an earlier number. Now, one of the other things, speaking of the Nordyke twins, uh, is that their documents seem to have been reduced to microfiche, and Barack Obama's was not. Am I correct on that? Well, that's, again, one of the problems is that if you take a look, Mrs. Nordyke, about a year uh, after the Barack Obama released the supposed short form uh, birth certificate, which I think was also a forgery, uh, I think that was the original forgery, um, Mrs. Nordyke said, well, my twins were born the next day, and she shows up in the Hawaii newspapers holding the copy of the birth certificates that she got in 1966 from the Hawaii Department of Health for her twins. And they were photostatic copies of microfilm where the her twins' birth certificates had been reduced to microfilm. Now, 
If that had been the case for the records in 1961, Barack Obama's birth certificate should have been a microfilm record. But yet that's not what was released by the Hawaii Department of Health on April 27th this year. It looked like a printed form that looks like the modern birth certificates being released by Hawaii. And what happened to the photostat? I mean, again, Hawaii has refused to answer any questions about the document chain, the nature of the birth certificate record for Obama. And Hawaii refuses to let anybody see the original birth certificate, which remains in the vault in Hawaii. Well, that in and of itself is suspicious enough. Now, one of the things, one of the things that's jumped out at me as a layperson is that Barack Obama Jr.'s uh, race was listed as African. Uh, does that mean that if I had been born in Africa, my race would be African too? Is African a race? Well, I mean, it, African is not a race. I mean, African is a geographical designation. There are many races in Africa. There are Asians. There are whites. There are I mean, many races. To be an African does not mean that the race that would never have been used again. As I said, when Charles Bennett was trying to put the Hawaiian system into a U.S. title statistics census standard, it would have been Negro. That would have been the obvious way to list the father's race. He was a Negro uh, from Africa. Africa was the country, not the race. That just jumps out at you. That looks like a modern, modern political correct statement that's on that birth certificate. It's never really been fully explained by the Hawaii Department of Health. It, it, you took the words right out of my mouth. I was going to say it looks like an attempt by a uh, very, very bad forger to impose 21st century political correctness on a mid-20th century document. That's right. I mean, look, in the, you know, in 1961, uh, Negro was the reference for blacks all across the United States. There was a census record. That's the race. And anything else would have been considered inappropriate and incorrect. And, you know, I've interviewed and talked to many of the nurses. These birth certificate records were filled out by the nurses in the hospital, uh, nurses or the clerks. And they would never, even if they asked Barack Obama Sr. what his race was, he said Africa, and they'd have put down Negro. One of the other things that jumps out at one uh, when reviewing this thing is that it differs from what various people told us it was going to be. Now, for instance, the previous head of the Department of Health in Hawaii, Fukino, is on record as saying that the document was half written and half typed. So we all expected it to be half written and half typed when it came out, but it was not. Well, and also, I've written about this extensively, Governor Abercrombie, when he came into office, said he was going to find the Obama birth record. And all Abercrombie told the Hawaiian newspapers he could find was a, a log item entry in a journal that uh, Obama has been born. And I think that was what was there resulting from the grandparents registering the birth. The birth address in the newspapers was the grandparents' address. Barack Obama Sr. never lives a day at that address. And on uh, Barack Obama Sr. and Ann Dunham, the mother, never lived as husband and wife. So suddenly it comes out with this birth certificate form, and I had been told in early February uh, by my sources in Hawaii that the birth certificate had been forged and a copy was ready to be placed in the, it had been placed in the log in the Hawaii vault, Department of Health, and was ready to be released to the public. And I wrote an article about it for World Net Daily. Uh, Joseph Ferrer did not publish it because we didn't have two sources. But that argument's on record in the files of the World Net Daily that I've been told early in February this year that the birth certificate record had been forged, and I think we're now looking at the forgery. Do you think that's what they're going to show early Tates and Doug Vaught and I think it's, is it Paul Ire uh, when they show yeah. up on, uh, the ten, on, on August 8th at 10 a.m.? I think the Hawaii Department of Health, again, will try to stonewall. They'll try to ignore that um, uh, that attempt to deliver the subpoena. Uh, I, I think there's legal assistance, legal help building for orderly tapes in Hawaii from local Hawaii attorneys. I've been aware of these efforts over the last few days. And I think the Hawaii Department of Health would be very ill-advised to not comply with that subpoena because it will not be the last effort being made to force a legal freeing of the records is to be made public that the Hawaii Department of Health has in their vault. 
Uh, I think that the records in the vault, if they do look like what has been released, it's going to be a forgery. I think we've shown what has been released is a forgery. It's a carbon copy of that. That document, too, is forged. I think the Hawaii Department of Health is in a bind. I think this document is made up, and they don't quite know what to do about it. Now, Hawaii is saying, oh, but we verified that Obama was born here. We had the registration of his birth, maybe from the grandparents. Remember, Hawaii gave Sun Yat-sen, the Chinese nationalist leader, a birth certificate. He was born, obviously, in China. It's, uh, Hawaii has been the easiest state in the country to get a birth certificate from. All you basically got to do is have the family come and give testimony that the baby was born in Hawaii and to get a Hawaiian birth certificate. So the Hawaiian department's got a lot of, yeah, and look, common sense. Obama had really wanted to prove that he was born in Hawaii, and the records were there to justify it. Why wouldn't he have told the Hawaii Department of Health to open their records to public examination and independent forensic examination? That hasn't been done because the cover-up is still in place. Let me uh, let me play something for you here that pertains to how the media is treating this subject. Now, as a multiple-time New York Times bestseller, you have for many years kind of been a media darling. They love to get you on Fox. They love to get you on the shows because of just how popular you've been as an author. But listen to this clip that comes from the John Gibson show on the Fox Radio Network uh, regarding uh, a, a caller named Gary who calls in to try to make the case that the birth certificate is fraudulent. And uh, John Gibson's little sidekick, Angry Jay, or I don't don't really know his name. He's some little mealy mouth sidekick wannabe. But uh, it takes two shots at you during this. And I want you to listen to this and give me your reaction to how the media is treating you, especially considering that this is Fox Radio. I see. Okay. Yeah, elected service uh, registration backdated and fraudulent. The room Corsi on the line, everybody. <laughs> well, you know, my book deals haven't worked out that yeah, great. Yeah, John's so. not getting any, Gary. You mean the book deal like Jerome Corsi got, that one? Stop, stop sniping at me, uh, you know, angry Jay or whoever. Angry I'll do what I want to do. Were you able to hear that? Yes, I heard it. I mean, I thought it was pretty disgraceful. Uh, the book, by the way, Where's the Birth Certificate, became a New York Times bestseller, and we're about sold out at WND with the ones that were printed. it will probably reach 100,000 copies sold, and it's still in demand. Uh, the mainstream media is not doing its job, and even Fox is moving to the left, I think. Uh, it's, it's disgusting to the American people who feel that we've got a forger and a usurper in the White House, and it's not being treated seriously by Congress or the mainstream media. Fox had better watch out, because the history of presidents who don't show documents and who lie to the American people is a none too favorable. Richard Nixon is my proof of that. And Fox has been covering for Barack Obama. And that becomes obvious to the American people. There will be a major backlash against Fox. Well, I've already stopped watching and stopped listening, so you can uh, put me at the uh, front end of that backlash. I don't think I need to wait at this point. Uh, I had a Fox News contributor on a few weeks ago, and she looked like Muhammad Ali, ducking and dodging and weaving uh, to get away from the issue whenever I brought it up. Uh, since then, she she I never had a problem getting through to her prior to. Uh, her appearance on the show and after the show, she won't take phone calls, won't return emails. Uh, Fox News, and we're going to talk to General Bellaley in a little bit, uh, has apparently been uh, told not to discuss this. But as we know, we've got a big day coming up on August 8th. We've got Orly Tates here next to talk about that. Dr. Corsi, thanks for being on the show, and I wish you continued success, continued success in your quest to expose Barack Obama for being the imposter that he is. Thanks for being on. Uh, thanks. Great honor and pleasure to be with you today. Thank you. Always. My next guest has fought a tireless effort over the last few years to expose the documents necessary to find out who Barack Obama is or isn't. Uh, a major breakthrough has, has happened recently as she has obtained a subpoena to get a copy of Barack Great. Obama's uh, original birth certificate. Orly, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Orly, give us an update as to what's going on 
and uh, you know what you think will happen on August 8th at 10 a.m.? Well, I do expect that the health department in Hawaii will uh, try to uh, stop me, will be stonewalling, and will do anything in their power not to show their cards. Um, the case, the original case from which uh, the subpoena came is State v. Astro. And this case in itself is really explosive. And based on this case alone, Obama needs to be removed from the White House and uh, moved into the Big House. Uh, I have found that most of his life, he used a Connecticut social security number. We were able to link him to this number through his selected service records that show that he's using this Connecticut number 04268-4425. Social security verification system states that this number was never assigned to Obama. That's clear evidence of fraud, evidence of fraud on its, uh, on its face. Even if Obama were to have a valid birth certificate, just for using, fraudulently using someone else's social security number, number that were never assigned to him, uh, he, it is a criminal act, it's a serious felony for which he needs to be removed from office and criminally prosecuted. Uh, and uh, um, this case went into discovery. There was a problem with most cases against Obama where people were told that they have no standing, there is no jurisdiction. Uh, the judge moved this case into discovery. He ordered the uh, Department of Justice to file any dispositive uh, uh, pleadings that they uh, have. And they have filed a motion for summary judgment. This is a sort of a last ditch effort. This is the last motion that uh, a party to defend would file before trial. Uh, and uh, um, I have responded. I filed an opposition to this motion. And I have filed uh, all the information showing that, indeed, Obama is using a social security number from another state. He never was a resident of Connecticut. Clear fraud. And I also provided information, uh, affidavits from three experts showing that his birth certificate is forged. Now, that's another indication uh, relating to, uh, to Social Security fraud, as typically people who do not have a valid birth certificate would have to resort to uh, use, uh, fraudulently obtaining a Social Security number. People who have a valid birth certificate don't need it. Uh, if you were to have a valid birth certificate from Hawaii, he would have no problem in getting a valid Social Security number from the state of Hawaii. And clearly, he does not have it. Uh, so uh, I have actually I issued three subpoenas. One came from the US District Court from the District of Columbia. Second, I issued, and subpoena, keep in mind, it is uh, signed either by the court, clerk of the court, or the attorney. So second subpoena I signed as an attorney, and I submitted it. And I got a response from the Deputy Attorney General of the State of Hawaii. Her name is Jill T. Nagamini. And she stated, well, there is a technical error with this subpoena, and uh, besides, uh, um, due to the issue of privacy, we will not uh, we will not comply with the subpoena. And uh, I have already written to them, to the Director of Health and to the Registrar, that the issue of privacy no, long, no longer exists because Obama uh, himself released the, the document in question. He posted it on whitehouse.gov. So there is no longer an issue of privacy. There is only an issue of forgery. And uh, finally, I served her with a third subpoena, which is uh, signed by the clerk of the court of the U.S. District Court for the District of Hawaii, which is a competent jurisdiction for them. So they, they don't really have any reason to not to comply. Let's say the first subpoena was from the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia. They could have said this is not a court of uh, competent jurisdiction. It's too far. Second was signed by me as an attorney. They could doubt that. But the last one, the third one, was signed by the clerk of the court in Hawaii. It's a federal court in, in Honolulu, Hawaii. And they just didn't respond. Uh, if they did not want to comply, they could file a motion to quash the subpoena. They could file uh, a, an opposition, or they could file um, they could file an opposition in D.C. or, or a motion to quash in Hawaii. 
and they had 14 days to do that. I have issued the subpoena on the 5th. According to uh, post office received, they received it on the 11th, and this was kind of surprising to me. Typically, it's a day or two to get uh, mail, but it shows the 11th. But even taking that into account, 14 days ended on July the 25th, and nothing was filed in any court. So uh, based on that, they're supposed to comply. Uh, as they did not, as I stated, they did not file any opposition. But uh, that remains to be seen. Uh, I will be there on August the 8th, 10 a.m. in Hawaii. I will make the trip. There are two experts that will make the trip. They will have all the equipment. They will be there with me. I got in touch with a local attorneys in Hawaii that would assist me if needed. Uh, and uh, what I expect, I mean, it would be great if they really comply and show their cards. But if they don't comply, then uh, I will go to the uh, I will go to court. I will go to the U.S. District Court. I will go to the state court. I will file necessary pleadings, necessary motions, and uh, we'll, we'll uh, go further uh, with with district court, U.S. District Court in Hawaii, uh, the uh, Superior Court in Hawaii, and there is a possibility that it will go further to the uh, Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, if you recall, Hawaii uh, um, belongs to the same circuit as California. I am from California. And I do have a case actually pending now. I had an oral argument actually on May the 2nd. And if you recall, Obama released this long-form birth certificate only a few days before the hearing on the 2nd. And uh, um, I believe the reason he did it was to state what the case is moot. And actually, that's what the uh, US attorney um, argued. Uh, and uh, he tried to create an impression that since he released the question, the, the document in question, it's moot. But uh, you know, the, the uh, panel was actually uh, very uh, supportive. They, they didn't interrupt me. They, they, they didn't uh, attack me. Uh, there were several hearings before where the panel uh, asked. Well, the panel was pretty harsh towards other attorneys. They even accused several attorneys of lying to them, and they were very courteous uh, towards me. They never said a word. They never attacked me, and. Uh, um, they, they listened attentively, and based on the questions that they asked the U.S. attorney, they seem to be uh, concerned about the fact that civil rights indeed are violated by the fact that the American citizens have no way of verifying if they have a legitimate president. So it is a possibility that if the uh, uh, Department of Health in Hawaii does not uh, cooperate, it will reach the Ninth Circuit. And I will ask to join the new case with the existing case in the Ninth Circuit for the same panel to review it and issue an opinion. Let me ask you very quickly, how long, if you are able to see the document on August 8th, and I have to be honest, I suspect you're not going to be allowed to see it, but if you are allowed to see it, how much time do you think you'll be given with the document? Will there be enough time for your experts, Doug Bacht and uh, uh, I guess, what is it, uh, Paul Ire? is that correct? Um, yeah. Okay, uh, well, how much time do you think they'll be allowed with the document? I know they're planning to scan it and put it on the Internet. Uh, do you think you'll be given the appropriate amount of time that you can conduct a thorough investigation? Yes, I believe so. Uh, you know, if they decide to cooperate, then they probably will give enough time. Uh, I, I would suspect that. Um, and, and it's really, I, I think they are in a bind. I think they are in a very tough spot. Because we know that when they post it on the internet, is is clear forgery. It's not even a good one. It's a cheap forgery. Clearly, the, the letters uh, are different. Uh, There's different typesetting, uh, different colors. You can see a mixture of uh, of um, something that is written by a pen and something that was written uh, computer generated. Basically, it's something that was created on computer. And a lot of people are involved. We're talking about uh, the the attorney uh, the um, White House counsel Robert Bauer, uh, Obama's private attorney attorney Judith Corley, uh, registrar of Hawaii uh, Alvin C Onaka, uh, the director of health 
Florida Party, a lot of people are involved, and, and they know that a lot of people might end up going to prison for this. And that's why they actually don't know what to do. I uh, and that they're, they're stonewalling, they're playing games. Uh, my 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 supporters have been calling, and that we're getting a response that uh, uh, Miss Fari left the island. We don't know where she is. I heard that. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> What if there is, you know, this is a director of health. What if there is epidemic, uh, uh, and they need to do evacuation or, or quarantine? Uh, there has to be somebody there who is uh, taking her place if she is on vacation, on leave, uh, left the island, or whatever. Uh, it, it's unbelievable that the whole Department of Health of Hawaii does not have a deputy uh, director of health. It's unbelievable, and we were calling. I, I, I. Uh, the service of being a certified male, got the gender uh, and I placed a number of phone calls and left messages with the deputy attorney general in charge of the case, uh, and uh, I um, uh, emailed her a number of times, but I don't hear back from her, and it's interesting that Obama's uh, supporters were writing on my blog, well, you didn't do it right, you didn't make arrangements with them to work out a date that's convenient for all parties, and because you didn't make arrangements, they might not comply. But this is absolutely ridiculous. There were hundreds of phone calls and emails made, they just don't respond. How can you make arrangements, uh, convenient arrangements, uh, with people who don't want to cooperate and who are stonewalling you? You can make arrangements, you know, when you have a case, I don't know, uh, I don't know, a car accident, and you yeah, have parties or business disagreements, people uh, arrange for a date, they have subpoena, they have deposition and so forth, but with this, you, you can't achieve anything because people are just engaged in cover-up uh, and they're aiding and abetting a very serious crime, they know that, and they're trying to evade. Uh, the, there is another issue, they, they might be hoping that the judge on the case, Judge Lambert, is, uh, um, is going to dismiss the case before uh, before uh, August the 8th, and in that case, they might claim that subpoena is moot. I don't believe this will happen because actually Judge Lambert gave me 14 extra days because it was a minor technical error. He actually gave me 14 extra days to uh, refile an opposition, which I did, and uh, it's possible that uh, you know, it's hard, it's hard to tell, but it's possible that the other side, the uh, Department of Justice, has an extra time, uh, extra week to respond. So that really gets to uh, August the 8th, and uh, I don't believe there will be a decision from Judge Lambert before August the 8th. I don't think it's possible to get a decision so quickly. So I will be there. Uh, it's not going to be moved by August the 8th, I don't believe so. Um, but uh, we'll see. But aside from that, do you that, think do you think you're going to get there? And since the head of the DOH is out of the you know out of the state, off the islands, they'll just have a big sign on the door that says, "Sorry, we're closed today." <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I I hope not. But it's interesting that one of my supporters called the attorney general's office. And keep in mind, according to their website, they have. Uh, 280 attorneys and uh, and 500 employees, and when they called uh, and asked to talk to the attorney in the minute, they were told she's not there, how about another attorney, and the secretary said, well, nobody is here, I'm the only one here answering the call, so I can do is take a message. And <laughs> it was too <laughs> shocking. We're talking about a department with 500 employees, 280 of them are attorneys, and nobody is there. Where did they all disappear? What, the kidnapped by Martians? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think there's going to be a big sign on the door that they're they're closed for a funeral for uh, the death of Barack Obama's political career. Uh, that's what I'm <laughs> that's what I'm hoping. Um, well, I understand you're going to hold a press conference that day as well on August day. I, I actually I'm not planning to do it really. I really don't want to hold any press conferences because I want to make sure I have my ducks in a row before I do it. I it, I was told that there is a reporter from New York Times who is planning to travel and be there. You know, sometimes reporters appear and I just, you know, don't know where they're coming from. And uh, I was, for example, in Kentucky when I went to the office um, 
of uh, the uh, Secretary of State of Kentucky, and uh, a reporter from Esquire went with us, and actually he shadowed me for two days in Kentucky. And I had those kind of situations where reporters would just come, uh, and, I, and I don't have um, prior knowledge who is coming and when, and they just they show up and they shadow you and they ask questions. But personally, I'm just trying to get to the bottom of this. Um, I really. Uh, I personally do not plan a press conference, but if the reporters will be there, uh, I will answer the questions. But also, there are other issues that I will be pursuing. Uh, uh, just yesterday, I submitted to the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia yet another FOIA, and that's against Kathy Romler, who is the uh, new White House counsel, and it's interesting that in my case in Washington, D.C., the judge ordered discovery. She did not dismiss the case right away, uh, but ordered discovery in the case on May the 1st. And the clerks of the court did not post his decision for a couple of days. Uh, during that time, on May the 2nd, uh, Robert Bauer, Obama's prior White House counsel, uh, resigned and announced that he will be his personal attorney. That's my understanding. Uh, and a new White House counsel was appointed, Kathy Romler. And I believe that this resignation of um, Robert Bauer is connected to this ongoing case. He knew that there will be a subpoena issued. He knew there will be investigation. And he wanted to be as far as possible. He also wanted to have, I, I, my understanding, a privilege, attorney-client privilege. Because if he becomes Obama's personal attorney, now he has uh, this privilege. And uh, so I filed a case against Kathy Romler because I requested to see the hard copies, uh, those two certified copies of Obama's birth certificate that supposedly were hand delivered to the White House by Obama's personal attorney, uh, uh, Judith Corley. And uh, I got no response. I submitted two letters. So now I filed a lawsuit against her as well. And uh, what we are seeing that this birth certificate that was posted on White House at Gov, which is on green safety paper, and the one that was shown to the reporters, one of them uh, who reported that supposedly she felt the, the stamp, um, uh, her name is Savannah Guthrie from uh, NBC. Both of them are actually two copies that were not separately certified by the registrar, but it looks like those were that those are two copies of the same uh, document that was created on the computer, a computer-generated forgery, and um, they just created one on white paper and one on green safety paper. But when you look at them and you analyze, you will see that the that the that the uh, um, uh, um, stamp, the date stamp and stamp of the registrar are placed in exactly the same spot. As you can understand, if there are two copies of the document and you want to get certified copies, the registrar would stamp it and he cannot place it in exactly the same spot. But um, you would expect that on two different documents that are separately stamped by the registrar, the stamp will be on one a little bit higher, a little bit right, a little bit to the left, uh, would be different. It, it's impossible. So clearly, it's something that was created on the com computer. And it looks like the stamp w was placed at the same time on, on, on computer. Uh, uh, that uh, The stamp was added on the computer. It's not the actual stamp. It, it's, it's really strange. Uh, so uh, we'll see what will happen in that case. And lastly, um, there will be also a case in the state court, because I have filed necessary documents requesting for information in the state court and the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, and uh, uh, the registrar responded. And it's interesting. He said that he's responding on his own behalf and on behalf of uh, Director of Health, Ms. Fadi. And I don't believe he even has authority to do so because uh, it, the response has to come either from the uh, from the official herself or from the office of the Attorney General. You cannot expect, you know, just one official responding for another. And, and he stated that they will not cooperate due to the matters of privacy. That's totally improper. And this will trigger an, a lawsuit in state court. And lastly, I filed a FOIA request to get the um, 
a regional birth certificate of a girl by, uh, by name Virginia Sunahara, who was born the same day, August the 4th, 1961, and she had medical problems. She died the next day. We found her death certificate, and her birth certificate is nowhere to be found. It's non-existent. And there is a suspicion that that's where the number came from, that somebody used the number of this uh, deceased infant thinking who would look for her number 50 years later, and that's the number that was utilized by Obama to create this forged birth certificate. And I also submitted to the court in Washington, D.C., uh, excerpts from the book of Bill Ayers, Obama's uh, close friend, and uh, uh, his um, uh, co, I think, co-president of Annenberg Challenge, who stated and admitted that he and his associates have created multiple forged documents, forged uh, social security documents based on records of deceased infants. And, I've, heard and that, I've heard that as well, and I don't know what the criminal uh, charges would be for that, but my understanding is they did it just to quote unquote mess with birthers. Um, I, we had a message, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but we have a message that's come in from Jim Siegfried of the United States Patriot Union, and he said he wanted to thank you for the work that you've done on this, and uh, he appreciates the work that everyone is doing uh, you know, uh, on this effort. So I wanted to let you know that uh, Jim Siegfried of the United States Patriot Union uh, wanted to give you a hat tip and say good job. Thank you, and I'm asking everybody who is listening to this program to help me by confronting the officials. Please go on my website, orlypageesq.com, O-R-L-Y, tears and tone, A-I, tears and tone, Z, ESQ.com. Download two documents, two pieces of paper, and it's on the very first page. Uh, actually, I knew I would be doing this program, so I reposted those. One Thank you. Is is a document from the uh, from the Selective Service uh, Administration uh, showing Obama using this Connecticut Social Security number zero four two six eight four four two five. Below it, there is a letter from Social Security Verification System saying that this number was never assigned to Barack Obama. That's it. Uh, we got him. This is clear proof. And what we need, what I need, and what this country needs is for you, the teachers, to go to the town hall meetings with your congressmen, senators, governors, any official you can think of. Bring those two pieces of paper. Now, don't tell them in advance that you want to talk about it, because if you do, they will never let you speak. So tell them you want to talk about something else. Uh, if you are talking to Republicans, tell them about cutting spending, Obamacare, if you're talking to uh, the, the, the Democrats tell them uh, that you love Obama and you're a huge great supporter. They're going to love you. No, tell them something that you want to hear, that they want to hear. And when they call on you, take those two documents out of your purse, if you're a woman, out of your uh, pocket, uh, uh, hold or whatever, if you're a man, and stick those in front of the cameras, stick those in front of the faces of those uh, elected officials. And demand answers. Tell them, look, for nearly three years now, this issue has been going on. Uh, Dr. Tate, uh, this lawsuit, this is irrefutable, undeniable proof that Barack Hussein Obama is a criminal. He is a complete fraud and a criminal sitting in the White House with a forged birth certificate and invalid social security number. Orly, I'm, I'm sorry. That is all the time we have. I have to get on to my next guest. But I want to thank you for being here today. I want to encourage everyone who's out there to follow her advice, download those documents, take them to your next town hall meeting, make it clear that anyone that's been elected, especially those that have been elected by the Tea Party, can just as easily be primaried out in 2012 if they're up for election then, and let them know that you will not vote for them again. Because so let's face it, that's all these people want is to protect their jobs and to stay in office. Let them know you will not vote for them again unless they take action on this issue. Uh, Orly, you thanks. Know yeah, uh, you know what, let me tell you just one other thing that people sure. can do. They can contact media and, and provide those documents, provide the documents from Mr. Irie and Mr. Vogt, and demand that the media talk about this issue, that they report on it, or else you will be contacting the authorities and uh, uh, you will be contacting uh, FCC as well as your local uh, attorney.
Attorney General and uh, District Attorney and demanding persecution of members of the media for aiding and abetting this massive fraud of the American citizens. Massive I, think that's a great, I think that's a great idea. In fact, Obama's birthday is August the 4th. Let's throw Obama a birthday bash by calling great. every media outlet you can think of and by contacting your, uh, your public officials. Uh, once again, Orly, thank you for being here today. Thank you very much. My next guest is the person who actually discovered the Social Security card issue, and we're going to talk to her today about how that came about, as well as some of the lame excuses that are being put forward on some of the OBOT sites as to why there may be an issue with Obama's Social Security card. She's been a private investigator, I believe, for 30 years, but we'll, we'll verify that once she comes on. She's been pursuing this doggedly, just like Orly Tate. She's one of those people who's put up with all the names. Anyone who dares to say Barack Obama isn't perfect, Perfect. Barack Obama is having a bad hair day. Barack Obama should have gotten congressional approval before bombing Libya, is immediately branded a racist. Uh, their expertise is called into question. They're called horrible names. They're smeared by the OBOT sites as well as by certain aspects of the media. Uh, much like my previous guest, uh, Susan Daniels has put up with many of those same things, and we're going to talk to her right now about that. Susan, welcome to the show. Hi, Mark. Thanks for having me on. Oh, I I wouldn't dream of doing a show like this without including <laughs> you. Uh, you. You have uncovered something that I think if you had uncovered it about anyone else besides the chosen one, we would, uh, you know, any of us having the same issues with fraudulent documents would uh, be wearing an orange jumpsuit and handcuffs about right now. Oh, yeah. Oh, but yeah. Go ahead and tell us. George how Bush. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. George Bush would have uh, uh, been in handcuffs and incarcerated a long time ago. Oh, yeah, tarred had, and feathered and run out of town. You name it. So tell us, how did you? what made you get on one of the databases that's only available to private investigators and check out Barack Obama? The, the, the pseudo-urgency of the TARP bill and the stimulus bill. Uh, it's, red flags started going up. And I said, there's something seriously wrong here. And uh, with the encouragement of a friend of mine, he said, you know, how about taking a look at this for me? And I said, not a problem. And uh, put in to a database, Barack Obama, uh, Chicago, Illinois, up pops a Social Security number. Never dreamed anything would come up. Up pops a Social Security number, and it says, issued in Connecticut, 1977 to 1979, I immediately, without doing another single thing, knew it was fraudulent. Um, I've done this work actually for 18 years, and uh, I've looked at thousands of birth certificates, knew how old he was, knew where he was during those two years, and knew it was fraud. I mean, there's no doubt. And now we've been able to pin it down to the last two weeks of March in 1977 when it was issued. Now, how does, that, how does that correspond to when he had the job at Baskin-Robbins in Hawaii? Uh, it, would be, it would be the same year. However, why would his sister, his, his half-sister, have a Hawaiian birth certificate, and he's got one from Connecticut? I'm not sure I have an answer for that, but then again, Barack Obama doesn't have an answer either, so I don't feel so bad. Oh, no. He, no, he definitely does not have an answer for it. Um, he, he is using a, it is a felony, and he is using a, a, a Social Security number that was previously issued to someone else. He did not, he was allegedly issued this number in 77, but did not start using it until 86. Now, we have OBOT sites, and I don't think I have to mention the one in question, but they are trying to make excuses for this. Now, first of all, they have a quote that says, and this, this apparently is from the Social Security Administration, and I'm going to read this to you in its entirety. One should not make too much of the geographical code. It is not meant to be any kind of usable geographical information. The numbering scheme was designed in 1936, and then they put it parenthetically, before computers. 
thank you for telling us that. We had no idea that 1936 I know, was I the thought they were, I thought Yeah, I were. thought they had them then. I really did. To make it yeah, easier I, for the SSA to store the applications in our files in Baltimore, since the files were organized by regions as well as alphabetically, it was really just a bookkeeping device for our own internal use and was never intended to be anything more than that. My first thought was, is God probably didn't give us unique fingerprints and unique DNA because he wanted forensic experts to be able to trace people back to a crime scene, even though it wasn't the even though it wasn't the initial intent, that doesn't mean you can't use fingerprints and DNA to trace someone back to a crime scene. But you tell yeah. me, uh, if this system, whether its intent was uh, to assign geography or not, was adhered to religiously by the SSA, the Social Security Administration, can it not in fact be used for that purpose? Absolutely. And they just changed it on June 24th now that they're going to be assigned randomly. <laughs> is that to cover now, the blood you, of the next Barack Obama? Yeah, yeah. What you just read is an outright lie and was added to the Social Security site because I printed everything off their site two years ago, and none of that was there. It was. It said the first three numbers are the, I, I, you know, assigned for to the residents of the state. That they, that they have a permanent address when they apply for the Social Security number. Well, one of the other things the OBOT site is pointing out is that uh, an affidavit you filed, perhaps in correlation with one of Ms. Tate's trials, where they right. look at the date of birth associated with this particular Social Security number, and right. the first one there is 1890, and then the second right. ones have more of a modern format, 08 slash 04 slash 1961, uh, 04 slash 08 slash 1961. I guess they couldn't make up their mind on month versus date. But they, they're they saying that that 1890 is nothing. It's just some number that's, that appeared there. They're wrong. It, the, fact um, that it's uh, under, uh, the fact that the heading is dates of birth associated with this Social Security number apparently means nothing to them. They think that for <laughs> no reason someone just stuck the date 1890 under there, yeah. not even thinking for a minute that maybe someone born in 1890 – didn't have an actual birth certificate and wasn't sure of their exact birth date. But you tell me, <laughs> but you tell me, 1890, is that a date or is that some mystical, magical number that no one will ever be able to figure out what it means? Kind of like that doodling on the birth certificate we're going to get to in a minute. Oh, yeah. Well, that is, uh, that is I believe, the, um, the year of the person who originally got it. Um, as you know, Social Security started in 1936. And it was voluntary. Um, and a lot of people never had Social Security numbers and, and until they became mandatory. Uh, my theory is, um, and if I, if I remember correctly, they accused me of saying a man who was born that year. Well, I didn't say a man. I said a person who was born that year in 1890. I believe that they had no use or no need for a Social Security number. If you were self-employed, you certainly didn't need one then. Um, until 1977, when I believe the person got sick, they would have been 87 years old and would have had to have had a Social Security number to get medical care if they needed it. And I think that's what – I have never seen another one uh, like that like that particular document you're talking about that also has somebody's date of, uh, date of birth in the European fashion and the American fashion, because that's what those are. That's interesting. Now, my other question for you, though, and I think this is important, ha have you ever just seen a year listed by itself without a month and day? No. Okay, so the 1890 number is suspicious just by it its fifth. It means something, yes. It, 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 it's, it, is, it definitely means something. Now, the other thing that they bring up is the zip code. Now, do you want to talk about that? I do want to talk about it because if you go to, uh, again, an OBOT site, what they're going to say is is that 
well, uh, the Connecticut birth certificates start with O. The Hawaiian birth certificates start with what a nine. Some some right. low level clerk just made a clerical error, and of course, my first thought, uh, Suzanne uh, or Susan rather, is that uh, this man's whole life has been a series of clerical errors. Oh yeah, I mean, clerical errors. On his birth certificate, well, somebody put African instead of Negro because it was a clerical error. A lot of his mom's right. travel passport records have disappeared due to a clerical error. He got Connecticut uh, Connecticut. A social security number instead of Hawaii due to a clerical error. The man's whole life is a history of clerical errors and documents that have been sealed. Well, they think we're dumb enough to believe that. Go ahead and tell us why. Tell us why that that wasn't just a clerical error where a oh, nine okay. was mistaken for a for a zero. Because uh, there were there were two social or zip code numbers associated with in in Hawaii with Barack Obama 96814 96826 26 was for the apartment building that he lived in with his grandparents and that is a couple of high rises um, from what i'm told they moved to several different apartments in there but the 26 is the the zip code that went to that and in fact that was the zip code he used on the alleged application for his selector service number and i say alleged because that's a that's a uh, forgery too well what i did is i went to the uh up or usps postal site looked up zip codes uh, cities by zip code and i entered um instead of the nine i entered 068814 and 06826 the 26 has never been used as a zip code, and the 14 is an APO address, military address only in Connecticut. So I'm sorry, no clerical errors here. Okay, well, thank you for explaining that because uh, there is no reason why Barack Obama would have been using an APO address, and the other two possibilities don't even exist if you switch out the nope. the, the O for a nine. So the the whole right. thing is just a ridiculous attempt. And he didn't get he didn't get it a uh, Connecticut number at the age of fifteen when he was living in Hawaii. As I've told people before, had it come back as a California number. I'd have gone, eh, you know, maybe. When I saw Connecticut, I immediately knew. And every single thing that I have found in the last two years supports what, I, what my uh, initial uh, conclusion was. Well, one of the things we know is that as people try to fake an identity, they often assume various numbers by people that are dead. I mean, it's been suggested that his birth certificate number is a uh, baby that was born and then died a short time later in Hawaii, and now we're finding out that his Social Security number may in fact be a number that belonged to someone who was born in 1890 and probably applied for it very late in life. Uh, very late in life due to the fact that they uh, needed it for various uh, uh, medical reasons or, uh, you know, right. uh, many of the reasons that we have at the end of life for needing a Social Security number. So uh, my question, well, I have a couple more uh, for you. Uh, one is what type of hate mail have you received? Because as you well know, anytime you dare to criticize the chosen one, you're going to hear you're a racist, you know, you're going to have your, your expertise questioned. Uh, if you go to the OBOT site, every single person, every single expert that has come forward, you know, people have been published dozens of times on Adobe software. People have been typesetters for 50 years. Ah, they're not really experts. But then again, the OBOT sites don't even give the name or names of the experts they cite. And oftentimes when we see these so-called uh, Obama supporters who are Adobe experts, they won't even use their real name. They go by stupid names like Dalek Master and uh, you know some of the, some of the other names they give themselves. They don't even have the courage to attach. Yeah, their they're opinions. cowards. They're yeah, they're cowards. cowards. My, I, everything I have out there has got my name, address, and phone number on it. I could. I, I want people to know it's me. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I, and so, I, I'm not hiding from anybody. Uh, yeah, I only. You know what? I've only. Uh, besides these stupid. Um, uh, Obot sites, which I don't even pay attention to because the you know the allegations they make are are so preposterous about the social security number. But there is one person that has sent me 
a couple of, and it, you know what, they're not even nasty. They're just dumb emails. And every time uh, what I do is, like the, the, the other day I saw Obama's numbers are, are falling so rapidly down to 40% approval, I just turn around and email these to the guy. And I know it's a guy, even though he goes by the name of Mary Adams. I, <laughs> I know it's a guy. God. Well, no, I, I, just, I, just, I, just, I just have to laugh because, you know, I've been uh, – I've been on the Amazon site battling some of these people, and they'll say, well, you know, none of those experts are, are experts in Acrobat. They're experts in other areas of Adobe. Yeah, someone, I get like that is matters. As if, as if someone who was an expert in, you know, uh, Photoshop or Illustrator wouldn't know enough about Acrobat to answer these questions. So then you ask them, oh, by the way, what's your real name? What are your credentials? Have you been right. published on Acrobat? And they're like, well, no, but unlike those people, I can back Back up what I'm saying. Yeah, perhaps in your yeah. own little liberal mind you can. Um, oh, well, they, well, they, I, they won't even give their names. No, because they're complete cowards, and they don't want their names associated right. with such a... Uh, they're exactly right. I know, I know that I, what I found, I know that he is using a fraudulent number and has for 25 years. Um, I'd be a crazy woman to make that kind of accusation against the President of the United States if I wasn't 100% sure, and I can back it up. I can prove it with documents. Well, I, and you certainly have done a great job at that in the face of a, a lot of opposition. So where, where are things with you right now? Do you feel your work is done on this? Are there continued, continued efforts on your part? Are you assisting? No, I have. There, there's, there's, some still, there's some things I'm still working on. Um, there is uh, there's a huge project that I haven't even started because I would need – I would literally need hundreds of people to help me with it because it involves so many documents. But, no, I'm not done. Not only that, almost daily somebody is sending me new information of, of things to follow up on. Um, there are people involved in this mess that I would like to interview. Um, I, I'm, no, I'm, not, I'm nowhere near done. Well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm catching able... my second wind. If you if you want to start your own blog talk radio show, get with me. I'll be happy to set you up. Uh, now, uh, <laughs> great. At, at this point, uh, I've got to move on to uh, General, excuse me, retired Major General uh, Paul Vallelie. But I want to thank you for being here today, and more important than being here today, thank you, thank you for having the courage to do what you've done. Uh, you know, as I like to put uh, at the bottom of all my emails, all that is necessary for evil to triumph is for good men and for that matter women to stand by and do nothing you are one of the people who have uh, who has chosen not to stand by and do nothing and I thank you for your courage uh, that most of uh, our opposition lacks well thank you and thank you so much for, for uh, allowing me to come on to your show I really appreciate it absolutely we'll talk to you soon thank you mm, bye bye My next guest is Major General Paul Vallelie. He is a graduate of the West Point Academy. He was a military analyst on Fox News for seven years. He currently lectures on national security matters. He is the co-author of books such as Endgame, The Blueprint for Victory for Winning the War on Terror, Baghdad Ablaze, and War Footing, and currently is the chairman of the Stand Up America Project. General Vallelie, welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much, Mark. Happy to be with you from the mountains of Montana. Fantastic. I know you're out there looking for bears, so keep keep one eye on the bear and one eye on the cell phone while we're talking. <laughs> All right. There you go. Uh, now, the reason I've got you on today is that I believe you to be unquestionably the most unimpeachable witness who has come forward to state that the birth certificate, the long-form birth certificate released by President Barack Obama, is in fact a forgery. How did you come to that opinion? Well, when it was first produced, of course, we had seen copies of it far before uh, the White House released that same copy of uh, live birth. Uh, and it was apparent at that time that there were many 
and discrepancies uh, in that document. So after uh, Obama released it at the White House, uh, we had a number of technicians uh, who went over it, and and they unlayer it uh, is what they call it in that business. They can actually unlayer a document and go through and see if there's anything that was posted on one or copied or used uh, Adobe or some form of uh, Photoshop, you know, all of those high-tech programs they use today and clearly the majority of the analysts, not one, did not say it was not a forgery. How many and analysts, so, uh, many analysts looked at it? I, I, I'm sorry, General, how many analysts? I only, had, uh, I only had three, but I got feedback from some other retired CIA uh, uh, analysts uh, that they had looked at it as well. So I would take their word for it over uh, the, the White House uh, in, in that regard. And when you look at it, even uh, Kenya, the uh, birthplace uh, of his father, uh, won the birth certificate, as I understand, was not even a country of Kenya then. Uh, and there's certainly so much information uh, on his background, uh, his college transcripts, the Social Security that, you know, we think uh, American people have been uh, perpetrated probably by the greatest fraud ever put on the American people through our election system. Um, we have not ever seen, and I don't think it exists from our investigation, that there is a actual birth certificate as you and I would have, that I had to produce when I was in the Army. So you have the lack of a, a original birth certificate. Uh, you have a forged copy of a live birth. And then when you look at the Article 2 of the Constitution on the natural borns of both of his parents in the United States, that's not valid. So. Uh, he was not properly vetted uh, during the election process, not only at the federal level, but uh, also at the state level uh, that needs the vetting to make sure candidates uh, have met the uh, constitutional uh, requirements. So this whole uh, situation is still up in the air. We don't appear to have any strong lawyers in Congress that will take it on. The Justice Department under uh, Attorney General Holder will certainly cover up everything as he's been ordered to uh, in regards to the background of Obama. We know that the Old Dominion uh, College uh, records that were released uh, indicate that he applied there for student aid as a foreign student. We also have a copy of a uh, of a form in Indonesia, his father, Sotero, uh, when he adopted Barry Sotero, who is the real, that is the real name of Obama. In fact, had him down as a Muslim uh, in Indonesia. Okay, uh, I, I guess one of my questions for you would be, what conversations have you had with Congress or members of Congress regarding this issue, and what kind of feedback are you getting from them? I've had uh, no personal contact. I've tried to stay away from that, arm's length with the members of Congress because I know that other uh, organizations and people have been pressing not only Congress, but the, uh, the court system all the way up to the Supreme Court. So uh, running our national products uh, project, which is Stand Up America, I have sort of stayed arm's length from any of that. Uh, they all know from the publications and the interviews that I've done on television, radio, and in the articles that uh, uh, you know, my, my question is, uh, just like I had to go through when I went to West Point and in the Army, uh, all of that vetting process, a background check when I got my uh, secret and top secret clearances, now I know what I went through in that, that Obama was not vetted that way and now has become the President of the United States. So someone in government is either guilty of massive corruption and cover-up uh, or they're strictly naive as to what has to be done to enforce the uh, Constitution and the laws, the election laws of the states. And now that's that's the investigation that needs to come forth and it needs to be initiated uh, by the FBI. Uh, to some degree, uh, uh, the, uh, the Justice Department and certainly members of Congress. Uh, the word I get, though, out of Washington is that uh, they don't want to press that point that he's not eligible because it will create a black uh, backlash. Well, I don't accept that. Uh, we are a nation of law and order. 
we have one of the, if not the best, uh, constitutional uh, governing uh, document that's ever been created by man. But we have a continued violation of that document, uh, not only by members of Congress, but uh, members of the executive branch, and to some degree the, the faulty work uh, within the judicial branch. So uh, we have a complete uh, uh, breakdown uh, in our government, in my opinion, at this point in time. That's why we need to have a national call to action to stand up. We've got to take this country back. And it may be required even before the election next year because we're in such dire straits economically. As I put out, Mark, the greatest threat to America right now is financial collapse. And the second would be the ineptness and the corruption of, uh, of our governing officials, both elected and uh, those that have been put in positions of power within State Department, Defense Department, and so on. So uh, the United States uh, is uh, on a precipice, in a precipice here, uh, going over the cliff, and uh, we're looking at uh, really some uh, a tremendous pain and chaos that's going to occur in this country, and I'm afraid most of the people are still asleep. It, it certainly seems like that. Either they're asleep or they simply do not want to face the issue. And with that thought in mind, I'd like to ask you how you're being treated by the media. Now, I fully expected the mainstream media to stay away from this issue until maybe one day they're forced to cover it because it becomes so big. But I'm finding that the traditional conservative media outlets, talk radio, Fox News, no longer want any part of this issue. What do you make of that? Well, I was with Fox for seven years. I was their first military analyst after 9-11. They hired me uh, in September of uh, 2001, and, uh, of course, uh, at that time I covered most of the Middle East conflicts and uh, the war against radical Islam. And uh, I'm not in a contract with Fox now, but certainly Fox has been told the host and have to stay away from it. We know that from some inside information. They, yeah, they have treated me fairly. I, nobody's, uh, none of the major news organizations or the papers have really uh, attacked me at all. I think they realize my credibility, and so they have not done that. Now, of course, you get some negative emails and some ne negative blog postings, but for the most part, uh, uh, I'm treated uh, very well by 95% uh, of the media out there, so... They're not attacking me as some whacked out guy that has this on his mind. I'm just dealing with the facts, and that's what I was trained to do uh, in the Army and uh, how to deal with the situation when you're in a battle, that you deal with the facts and you deal with the threats and you come up with uh, a plan to, uh, uh, to rectify that situation. Now, they're not attacking you, but at the same time, they're, they're hardly giving you a, uh, a mouthpiece or a platform uh, from which you can talk about this issue. I mean, have you been invited on any major network news program or any well-known conservative radio talk show to discuss this? Yeah, I've been on a number. The uh, Wall Street Shuffle out of Dallas, uh, WABC, uh, New York, uh, mm -hmm. Eric Klein, uh, uh, Steve Maltzberg, uh, John Batchelor, uh, 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 radio shows out of Seattle, uh, Los Angeles. Uh, so I've, uh, I've hit probably over 100 radio shows just in the last year. Uh, mm -hmm. Matt Roots uh, out of Tampa, Florida. So I do about six or eight radio shows a week. So uh, I get fairly good coverage around the country. That's that's good to hear. Uh, now, radio, uh, especially conservative radio, tends to not worry about what people are going to think or what the attacks are going to be. And when there's truth to be sniffed out, the, the conservative radio people tend to go for it. But television in particular uh, seems to be staying away from this issue. You say that Fox News uh, has been, or the, the people who have programs on Fox News have been told to stay away from this issue. Uh, does that mean going as far as to not even bringing it up at all? Well, that's right. You can see uh, what's going on on Hannity. Glenn Beck was taken to task because he started to probe and then he backed off. Uh, O'Reilly is totally clueless. Uh, he thinks everything's up and it's okay, right, in order. But I know from some of the people at Fox that I've had or uh, uh, connected with uh, that they basically were put out, let's not touch this issue. 
they even went out to an extent when they had Donald Trump on Fox and Friends and uh, Hannity, and they allowed him to go on. But basically, after that, as you recall, most of all of that uh, uh, question uh, that was posed to Donald Trump uh, all went by the wayside. So you can see there's an internal uh, message that goes out. Let's stay away from that issue. Yeah, so nobody wants to touch Obama, but he, uh, it's, it's in the court system. Um, they, uh, they, they're all complicit, which means they're all in violation of the Constitution to some degree. And if they're laying low in the government agencies that are responsible for this, then they're complicit. I mean, the amount of uh, data that's even being accumulated on the treasonous uh, lying uh, the uh, dishonesty with the American people that Obama and his people have cast on international and national news uh, that we have uh, probably, and we do have the most corrupt and dishonest government America has ever seen. General, where do you see this going? Uh, do you think the truth will ever come out? Do you think that this will ever be covered by the mainstream media or, for that matter, even the conservative media uh, in a big way? Do you, is this just going to die on the vine? It seems to me like ever since Donald Trump went to that press dinner and Barack Obama made one joke after another about him that everyone is afraid to tackle this issue. Uh, with that being said, will justice uh, ever be served in this case? Uh, if you look back in history, justice is always served in any country or government at some point in time, and that justice is served by the people who take on uh, autocratic uh, uh, leaders and those that think that they're higher power uh, than the people. So, yes, justice will be served. It's a matter of when. It may be uh, a chaos in America caused by the economic collapse of America. It could be caused by... Uh, an attack of Iran and its proxies on U.S. cities with uh, low-yield nuclear devices. So all of these could stir on the fall of the government as we know it uh, and put us in a situation where the people will take the government back. With the time we have left, I'd like you to tell our listeners a little bit about uh, Stand Up America, uh, your organization, what your mission is, and how they can get involved if they'd like to. Uh, we formed Stand Up America, three of us, uh, six years ago, and uh, the website for Stand Up America is www.standupamericaus.com, standupamericaus.com, and we, uh, we cover about five di uh, different areas. We uh, do a lot of publishing. Uh, we have a network throughout the United States of uh, key uh, issue experts, uh, we're mostly concerned about national security and make sure we're protecting the American people. Uh, so we also uh, uh, do radio interviews, television interviews. We do uh, events. We're, we're uh, staging a, an event for 9-11 out here in Montana on the 11th of September, and we're going to have Lieutenant General Tom McInerney, a senior Fox News analyst. He'll be out here as a guest speaker. So we do a lot of those things. But based on, uh, we have an intelligence section now that's out of California, and we process most of our international intelligence uh, and turn that into advanced information to provide our network. So that's basically what we do. Phenomenal. So we love everybody to join, uh, join Stand Up America for any amount they can. We need continual support, uh, but we're doing the right thing and we're exposing the right thing uh, to the American people as far as threats to the United States. I'll get with you after today's show. General uh, Valley, I appreciate you uh, being here today and giving us some of your time. I know you're actually in the mountains of Montana uh, looking for black bear right now, so for you to take time out from that to join us uh, was, was a great honor. And uh, as this issue progresses uh, through America, through the American media, uh, and hopefully eventually sees the light of day, as they like to say, sunlight is the best uh, sanitizer, uh, we'd love to have you back uh, some time to share your continued thoughts on this issue. That would be great, Mark. We'll enjoy doing it. Get a hold of us anytime. Once again, thank you for joining us today. I've greatly enjoyed having you as a guest. My pleasure. And we are back live with the start of the second half. And we are back live with the start of the second half of our show. Uh, we have a room full of computer experts, and we're going to go through the Obama 
document one line at a time and find out what's wrong with it and what the possible explanations are. Let me go ahead and bring everyone on. Uh, first of all, I think we'll do ladies first. I want to bring on Mara Zabest. Uh, Mara has uh, actually written uh, many books on Adobe software and served as the technical editor uh, on possibly as many as a hundred books. I think she lost count at some part, some point. Uh, she teaches private classes on Adobe, uh, InDesign, Illustrator, and Photoshop. Uh, she's actually a consultant to Fortune 500 companies and uh, frankly made a big splash in the news when she accompanied Jerome Corsi uh, during a press conference in Washington, D.C. Mara, welcome to the show. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for having me on the show. Absolutely. We've got a few more people to get to, and then we'll get started. Okay. I uh, also want to introduce uh, someone who might be a new name for many of you. Uh, this young man's name is Albert Renshaw. Uh, he is only 16 years of age, but a video that he placed on YouTube about the Obama birth certificate is creating quite a stir. Uh, Albert's full name is Albert Einstein Renshaw PhD that's actually what's on his birth certificate because he has his real one and uh, uh, all I can say is no pressure there uh, in terms of expectations uh, he taught himself to program an objective C and formed Apple apps for life LLC uh, to develop applications for the iPhone at one point his program iText was the number one paid app on iTunes and his company sells approximately 125,000 plus apps every year. So he's not just a smart young man, he's uh, he's a wealthy young man as well. Albert, welcome to the show. Thank you, it's good to be here. Yeah, yeah, I gotta tell you, 1.3 million hits on YouTube. As I joked with Carl uh, Denninger a few weeks ago, I mean, normally you need uh, college girls wearing something skimpy to get that many hits. Uh, that's that's, am <laughs> that's amazing that you would get that many hits on something as uh, dry and boring to some people as the president's birth certificate. So congratulations on that. Thank you. Okay, I've got a few more people to bring on, so bear with me. The next guest that I'd like to bring on is Joseph Newcomer. Uh, if many of you recognize that name, there's a reason why. Uh, he exposed the fake documents that were being used by CBS and Dan Rather uh, in, uh, as they pertain to the George W. Bush uh, uh, National Guard scandal. And as it turns out, he was able to identify some of the very same issues in those documents, which pointed out to the fact that they were computer-generated and not made on a typewriter. <laughs> And uh, just when he thought his life had returned back to normal and things were calm and quiet, uh, we're dragging him back in. <laughs> Joseph, welcome to the show. Well, thank you. I know the last thing you probably wanted right now is to uh, be pulled back into the uh, national limelight uh, in order to uh, proclaim a document fraudulent or not. But I think in your case, you want to make it very clear this isn't political. Uh, you're not saying, you know, whether he was born in the United States uh, or not. You're simply pointing out errors in a document, correct? That is correct. I, I have no political agenda in this at all. In fact, uh, I have not even seen most of the documents. I have seen the analyses other people have done. Gotcha. Now we've got one more person to bring on, so bear with me, and then we'll get started. Uh, last but certainly not least is... T oh, I'm sorry, I have two more people to bring on. Last but uh, certainly not least, we have Tom Harrison. And Tom, uh, after this document had been out for many weeks and people thought they had found everything that was wrong with it, uh, Tom dug deep and found some things that nobody else had seen. And that was some mysterious white dots that apparently are placed on one of the layers to cover something up. Tom, welcome to the show. Well, thanks for having me on. It was yeah. uh, an, an interesting find, and one provoked by someone who uh, yelled at me for being silly over the document being a fraud. It just made me mad enough to uh, go hunting things down because I was just commenting on the anomalies that seemed to be popping up and wondering if it was real. Quite frankly, on April 27th, I was happy the whole thing was over, and then I got dragged into it. I, I understand. Frankly, uh, I wasn't a birther until April 27th, and then I became one. One more person to bring on. Uh, Car Carl Denninger, 
uh, is a document expert with many, many years of experience. And Carl is also quite well versed in typewriters and is going to explain to us today why the kerning in the document could not have been done by an IBM Selectric typewriter in 1961, among other things. Carl, welcome back to the show. No, oh, thank you for having me back on. It's uh, and, and like your last uh, your last guest. I too was was dragged into this more or less against my will by a, an associate of mine uh, who emailed me uh, shortly after the release. I thought the entire thing was over and said, "You have to look at this. It is a obvious forgery." And I said, "Oh, get out!" I, and I I thought I was actually being punked by someone who I used to do some work with, and as it turns out, it was not the case. So you thought he actually went in and doctored the document and then sent it to you, and that's why it was such a poor forgery? Yeah, I mean that was my first my first blush guess when I opened it up and started going through it was that oh the, you know you went in and you screwed with this, and so then what I what I did was I grabbed an official copy from the White House and ran a cryptographic checksum against them, and they were identical. <laughs> so kind of like the boy at scream wolf. <laughs> yeah, except this time there really was a wolf. Right. <laughs> uh, well, let, let me uh, l let me start with a very young man named Albert Einstein Renshaw, Ph.D. Albert, there must have been some uh, must have been some serious expectations as far as you were concerned when your parents were born. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, you get teased about the name at all at school. All the time, but usually it's a good thing. Many people don't <laughs> complain. So. No, no, that's. I think that's great because uh, you know apparently your dad and uh, I think you said it was your dad's idea. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, so apparently he was right because by the age of fifteen, you had your own software company and had the uh, uh, highest selling app on iTunes for the iPhone. Correct. That is correct. Wow, at age 15. You know what that means? That means that in, in your short 16 years, you've done more than most of the uh, pathetic obots who've criticized your revelations about the document. <laughs> so, so congratulations on that. I'm going to start I'm going to start with Albert here because Albert, I think your video got to the internet first, got to YouTube first, and as I said, you got 1.3 million hits. When you opened up this document, uh, what was the first thing that crossed your mind in terms of things that were wrong with it? Well, the layers were definitely a big thing. I, I immediately went to scan many documents onto my computer. I looked at all the meta tags. Basically, you can see what software they use to uh, compile the PDF and whatnot. And I used all the settings I could find. They used Preview, which is just a Mac application, and they used Quartz to encode it. And I, I just, I tried every setting. I kind of reproduced any of these layers. So that was the first big clue. Um, there were a lot of things inside the actual PDF. There were links, and when you go to the links and look at the info, basically links is just when they will drag like an image or something into the document to place on top of maybe a template or something. When you look at the links, there were lots of editing done to them. It shows you how they scaled them. Most of them were scaled 24%, but then some of the links, the parts added onto the document were scaled 48% and they were turned different ways. And if it was just a scanner picking them up, you know, I can understand that they would all be scaled one way just because it's making it bigger or whatnot, but the, the fact that different parts of the birth certificate were scaled different sizes, it really seemed fishy. And there's, there's a lot of things on this document that make it somewhat look valid, and then there's a lot that just really say, hey, something's wrong here. You need to check this out. So I, I proceeded to make three videos after that finding. Now, after you put out the first video, the first thing that happened was a million people wrote you and said, you idiots, because they used OCR software, it can all be explained by OCR software. Uh, what was your response to that? That was video number four in which you responded, correct? Yeah. I, um, basically what I did was I, I re-scanned some documents I had laying around the house, and I re-scanned the birth certificate itself, and I used a bunch of OCR software. I used Adobe Acrobat OCR along with a couple of other things, and I wasn't able to reproduce any of the things they said would happen. I wasn't able to separate the text into certain layers. All that happened was you could select the text as text instead of an image. And if you take the original document, which apparently had the OCR applied to it, I couldn't select any of the text at all. There was no hint of OCR even being there, according to Adobe Acrobat Reader. 
Okay, uh, hold on just a second. Now, I know a lot of people are going to say, well, you know, Albert's 16. He's still in high school. Uh, we have Mira the best on the line. Uh, Mira, you've been published numerous times. You've been the technical editor on possibly as many as 100 different books on uh, computer software, Adobe software. Do you agree with what this young man is saying? I absolutely do. I also uh, heard the previous show when you had um, uh, Carl uh, Denninger on your show, mm -hmm. and I've talked to him as well on this. And I also would like to make the point that, that Carl makes, which I agree with, because I've done the same sort of thing. I've run tests on a lot of things that the arguments are out there just to see if, you know, it does happen. And with um, optimization, you know, I might be getting ahead of myself. Uh, you do get some layers, but uh, you never get any layers the way this document looks. Uh, you get layers that are kind of like blocks, just like if you, you took the, the, the sheet of paper and you just kind of cut it up in random squares, you know. There's nothing smart about the layers you get. It's just random picks of blocks that, you know, go into separate layers. Uh, so both uh, hang on, Mara, let me say something right now because you said there's nothing smart about it. Correct. Um, I want to read, and Carl, I'd like you to chime in on this as well because you've pointed this out. I went to a site called thefogbo.com, and, uh, and I've sent, I sent a copy of this out to most of you, I think. But one of the things they state is they t attempt to explain the layering issue is another way we can tell the compression process was performed by a computer and not a human forger is that the layers themselves do not even make sense from the perspective of a human forgery, uh, Carl, you are. Oh, 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 that's oh, that's yeah, that's absolutely false. Look, the the thing about you have to understand about a computer is that it runs a program; it doesn't have a brain. And so, when you have a computer do something like this, you get layers. But as was just stated, there's no intelligence that's observable in the selection of what goes where. So you take one of these documents, for example. Um, what was it uh, Newsday? I don't remember that. The Nation online, National Review online, took a a application, um, another document, scanned it, ran it through Optimize, diddled the settings to get the layers to come up. Because I've tried this several times, and sometimes I can get them, and sometimes I can't. But when you go through their document, their PDF with these layers, and you deselect some of them, you'll find there's a random little block of text here that disappears, and a random thing here that disappears, and a random thing. And that's how computers work. They look at something, they find things that are identical, that they can compress, and they can say, okay, this block here is absolutely identical to this block, so I can only have, I can put one of those into the file, and then I can just put a pointer in that says, reproduce this over here. All right? And that's how that process actually works. A computer, however, doesn't have a brain. It can't look at a document and say, okay, all of the numbers in the bait stamp except the last one go into this layer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it, 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 because the, the computer doesn't know what a bait stamp is, <laughs> All right? and so there's no intelligence displayed in computer processing of documents like this, but when a human is doing things, that's a different story. <laughs> uh, let, me, let me move over to uh, Joseph Newcomer as kind of the, the granddaddy of us all here in terms of pointing out fake documents, uh, having become somewhat of a national figure uh, during the CBS slash George Bush slash National Guard uh, fiasco. Uh, what's your take on the current document and what these other people are saying here today? Is that consistent with uh, some of the process you went through on those National Guard documents? Indeed it is. And I had stayed away from this controversy, but when... Um when I finally started looking at it, and I looked at the analyses of other people, I have not seen the documents myself, I do not disagree with any of the analyses I've seen. And the people who are saying, well, it's compression artifacts, it's this, it's that, mm -hmm. uh, if you listen to the people who just spoke, they did the important thing. They tried to reproduce it. That's the scientific method coming out and saying, well, if that's true, we can reproduce it this way. And the thing that I found was that a lot of people think that wishful thinking replaces facts. And so I once heard that somebody told me that a friend had once done this and saw this thing. Therefore, you haven't accounted for this phenomenon properly. Uh, it's just nonsense. You have to sit down and say, I have done the following experiment, and I have been able to precisely reproduce the artifacts of the question document. Therefore, you are wrong. That's a valid approach. And if you... The people who have done this 
have said, no, we're not seeing that, and that's, that's an important result. Well, you know, uh, Carl, you've actually looked at the compression issue, and you have compressed documents even more so than this particular document was compressed. Did you get any of those issues where, you know, uh, the uh, compression process resulted in areas of the document having a, the exact same pixelation or some of the other things that we saw with this document that sort of uh, waved a red flag that maybe it was a forgery? No, and that's one of the things that, that I found most interesting was I, you know, I happen to have both my birth certificate here and also my daughter's um, along with car titles and, you know, the kind of things that are on official paper that, that everybody has. And I've spent days with my scanner and Adobe Acrobat, the, the fully licensed version, going through trying to get something that looks like what we were given. And I can't do it. I can take a scan of my birth certificate, put it through the computer, it comes out about a megabyte and a quarter thereabouts in, in terms of actual image size. I then run it through Adobe Acrobat Optimize, and it's 150 kilobytes. Now, the, the White House document's 300K, okay? The AP version is considerably larger, and the argument is, well, we'd run this Optimize in order to get the file size down because we expected the download to be very popular. Right. Okay, I'd buy that. Fine, except when I take that optimized file and I open it up, in Illustrator, there are no layers in it. The only thing that the software did was put a clipping mask in, go back through the recompression, and optimize the compression algorithm to produce a smaller file size. Um, it didn't break everything up into 15 different layers or show any kind of intelligent design. Now, if I get very creative with the settings, I can get the system to produce layers, but then I get the blocky kind of thing that National Review Online saw and everybody else that has tried to reproduce this has seen. I cannot, no matter how much time I spend with the software, no matter what settings I use, I cannot get anything that looks anything like what Obama's birth certificate file looks like on the White House website. But even that belies another problem. The Associated Press scanned and published what they were given at that meeting. That document does not show any optimization artifacts. It is a straight scan with no gains. I can state that authoritatively because I've looked at that file in depth. Here's the problem. The paper that that document scanned on has a baby blue background. How did the same piece of paper magically transmute the color of the paper between the time that the White House got it and the Associated Press got it? Anybody on the, t on the panel have an answer? Well, uh, the obvious answer is that this is a fraudulent document. <laughs> <laughs> well, I messed up with that. <laughs> but I'm sure, I'm sure Fogball will have plenty of, you know, excuses for it. <laughs> I, I don't, I, you know, I don't need a computer a, to know that that's, there's error. something wrong with that, right? <laughs> it was well, a clear, clear, clear. Let's go down and take a, take a quick poll. I'm going to call you guys out one at a time, and I'm going to start, uh, I'm going to start with Albert. Uh, Albert, after reviewing this document extensively, is America's next Bill Gates. Uh, do you have any doubts that it's fraudulent? Well, yeah, I have. there's a lot of doubts that it's fraudulent. Um, more so than the long form, the short form birth certificate is 100% absolutely fraudulent. And the long form, there's a lot of, like I said earlier, there's a lot of things that make it look fake and there's a lot of things that, you know, it could be real. And most of that's covered up by the fact that it does look like it's somewhat been compressed. Um, the pixels have been changed to solid color and whatnot. Um, there's a lot of a lot of fishy things going on. So if it's not fraudulent, it may have been built up on top of a template, but it's definitely been modified with. with okay, that. fair enough. Mara, what are your thoughts? Um, I would agree with that assessment. I, you know, I, again, I, I, uh, many people have made the point that you know, until we see the original document and match the data, you know, we can't actually tell if it's fraudulent. However, I also would like to make the point that the mere fact that it's been edited, I, you know, I disagree with the fact that if the data matches, it's not fraudulent. But I think the, da the fact that it's been edited does make it a fraudulent document. That would be my stance on this. Um, I, and it's obviously edited. There's, there's no doubt in my mind. Tom Harrison, your thoughts? No, it is clearly a forgery. I can't tell you what, when, where he was born or when he was born. So I can't tell you the content is accurate, but the document itself is definitely a forgery, and I can demonstrate that very simply. Okay. Uh, whenever you're ready. 
Okay. Well, I'll tell you what. Let, we, we haven't given you as much time, and I haven't, I haven't uh, meant to avoid you. So you recently came out with some things that it looks like everybody else missed. Uh, talk to yeah. me. I, I stepped away from the content issues. I stepped away from, the, uh, from, from all of the layering issues and took a look at just one artifact. And it was one that st stood out glaringly. It's, subgroup, it's the first subgroup that you see when you open it up in Illustrator. I invite anybody out there who's got Illustrator to uh, you know, hum along with the tune here. Uh, bring up that first subgroup, zoom in on it, up near the top border of the safety paper, and you'll find a group of little white dots. What's interesting about those white dots is that when you turn off that layer, when you turn off that group so that it disappears, behind it you have completely undisturbed safety paper. Those white dots are over shades of green. Hmm. No scanner on the earth has x-ray vision. <laughs> it is not possible to have that green undisturbed background be hidden over under a scanned white dot. Therefore, the document's a fraud. When a layer is pulled off by optimization in order to allow it to go to a one bit, a one bit per pixel bit mask, behind it should be either transparent or white by convention. Also realize that whenever you have an object on a piece of paper and you have a color boundary and you scan it, you are going to have pixels that are dithered between the colors because you're never going to land precisely on the scanner's pixelation with the paper pixelation. So there's always going to be a boundary layer or boundary that's slightly irregular, slightly uh, one color and not, not the other. In this case, you've got stark white, no dithering between the white and the green safety paper. And when you turn off the layer, you've got undisturbed paper underneath. And, that was and I'm not looking, the result of a scan. I'm looking at that right now, and he's absolutely right about that. Yeah, I, yeah, I am as well. That's, that's just flatly impossible. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's what left with me. Once I got to there and people started responding to it, then I went on looking at other things on the document. And virtually every one of the layered pieces that lives in that document has got artifacts underneath it which are of a different color. Hmm. When yeah, you have two colors that actually, on one pixel, you have a fraud. Yeah, that's actually possible, though, in certain circumstances. I've been able to reproduce that. It's, it's fairly difficult to make it happen, but I've been able to reproduce that here. So that by itself doesn't scream at me, but this, the, the thing with the white dots is another thing entirely. <laughs> Well, what yeah, I found in particular, the National out, Review though. document, uh, the National Review P PDF uh, kind of uh, pointed this out because he had an image extraction to a black layer. And that document's very interesting, by the way, because most of it's transparent. It's about two-thirds transparent. If you, if, right. you put a, if you put a color layer behind everything and, and look at it, uh, most of the edit uh, of, the, of the opaque blocks are on the left and a few that wander across. But the area where the check boxes are, that's, mo that's virtually all transparent. Uh, so you have the, the, the extracted black layer over transparency, which is perfectly fine if you want to if you want to take away the white. That makes good sense. What is let me throw something out there for the lay people. When I looked at the various attempts to create the layers, what I saw were layers that looked like confetti, looked like they had been through a shredder. I yep. didn't yeah. see anything that approached the type of intelligent selection, despite what our friends at uh, the Fogbo. I had to say, I didn't see anything that approached that type of intelligent uh, selection. I, I, I saw a jumbled yes. up mess with no intelligence whatsoever. Yeah. Uh, as a layperson, am I off base with that, or no, no, that, that that's that's correct. That the, the it was a, a, a kind of a hodgepodge, but it looked like somebody had actually gone in and done that manually almost. But e even if it was automatic, it was unusual how it, how it was constructed. But it did demonstrate one interesting artifact. And this is something that Fogbo, of course, uh, in that article, they, they pointed out. He said, underneath an extracted, under, uh, extracted bit mask or, or image mask layer, you'll find nothing but white. And it claimed, of course, in the birth certificate, the Obama birth certificate, that that's what you found when you pulled off that, that layer and turned it off. You found nothing but white underneath. And, of course, that's, that's demonstrably false. Uh, for example, certificate of live birth at the top. Just look at underneath that uh, that uh, image mask, uh, and you will see on the safety paper you'll find all kinds of greens and grays underneath every letter of that phrase.
But what yes, is it, also not true. there is something that was demonstrated on the National Review PDF that Nathan Golding uh, p produced. And that was when the image mask characters were extracted, the grays and uh, other partial color pixels at the boundaries of the image mask uh, extracted characters remained on the white opaque background. Right. So you could see the outline with the white space, the stark white underneath. But you could see the pixelation that was there. Now those pixels overlap a little bit when rendered, but the bottom line is what was underneath was stark white and mm -hmm. you had boundary. None of the image masks on the Obama document have any boundary pixelation occurring. You have a white halo around them, or a whitened halo, but that's more evidence of erasure than it is extraction, because the pixelation should still be there. You should still see black shifting to green on the boundaries when the characters that are extracted. And that's just not there. I'd like to ask a question, too. Uh, the second empty box at the uh, top of the group, uh, the second group that's empty, that has the same sort of white pixels that you yep. talk about over the thing. That actually falls over on top of the very faint seal that's hard to see. Yes. And so it makes part of the seal go away when you turn it off, besides the fact that it still has the same characteristics of that there's green pixels underneath of it, as you said, with the X-ray vision thing. You know? Yeah, well, my, my indication on this, when I looked at those, I thought about this from my own experience with Illustrator, uh, I've been using Illustrator since 89, since it was on floppy disks, for crying out loud. Wow. And I look at some of the things that I've done with Illustrator where I'll try to create a little uh, mask on something. And I thought, oh, nuts, that's not working. And I just, I just select it and drag it off to the side. Right. I mean, how many times have anybody that uses Illustrator done that, where you just right. drag and something off to the side? Right, and then you forget about it. Right. Yeah. And you forget about it. Why this one? Because these two groups disappear visually when you're looking at the document, unless you have them selected so their blue box, blue select box pops up around them. Right. That's what I think happened here. I think these were a t an early attempt at editing uh, in, in, in one product or another, probably not Illustrator, maybe Photoshop, Correct. and just got left behind. And as the document evolved, never got reviewed again. And I, I can't tell you how many times I've opened up a document, I've gotten, found a stray rectangle stuck someplace that where I'd clicked and not done anything with it, but there was the artifact, and it didn't render because there was no stroke, what that means the boundary outline of the rectangle, right. and no fill. So the color, there was no color, so it just disappeared. And yet it's an artifact in the document. I think, I, I'm just guessing, but I think that's what happened here. I haven't yet put together a tool to move that thing around and see if I can find the spot where they were trying to place it. Place it, right. But that would be an interesting thing to do. Yeah. Uh, let me ask a question of Mr. Newcomer, uh, because you've been through all of this before. Uh, take us through the stages of the experience. I imagine at first you received a lot of angry hate mail and maybe a few people saying thank you, and there was a lot of denial, and then eventually everybody had to come to the conclusion that you were right. What was that process like for you? Because I have a feeling that many of the people on the panel today are going to experience the same thing. It, it went on for many, many weeks, long after I thought the controversy was finished. And yes, I was getting everything from people saying, thank you for exposing this fraud to how much did Karl Rove pay you? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, you know it, it's sort of everything in between those two. And that's part of the reason I stayed away from this, because I just felt I didn't want to deal with all that nonsense yet again in my life. And unfortunately, many of them are the wishful thinking people that I mentioned earlier, they once heard a rumor from a friend who once had knew somebody who once owned Adobe Illustrator <laughs> that maybe this might be the explanation, and therefore, since I didn't take that into account, I must be wrong. Right. And that, that just doesn't work as a way of making facts go away. They're, the facts are there, and when you spot these artifacts that you've all spotted, uh, there's, there's no good explanation. And I think that's the problem, is that those of us who are concerned with facts simply say, hey, this isn't so, and then we have to deal with all these people who say, well, I wish you were wrong, therefore you must be wrong. And that, I would say, was the bulk of the mail that I got. I love that explanation of it, yes. Well, well, that's pretty much, that's pretty much what it is, though. 
because because you know you look at you look at for example the you know the intelligent design issue, and you bring that up to somebody and you say, well, you know, can you reproduce this? And then and and then what you get is somebody like National Review Online that puts up a document that's a you know that's a scan and says, see, see, I got layers. I said, well, that's not what I said. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, I got a lot can of you that. make can you come up with something that looks like this? Right. And and there's this but 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 but, but I but I showed you layers. Well, well, I wonder, that wasn't what layers, we were talking about. Well, well, but that's what that, that wasn't what we were talking about. And, you know, and when if, and when they can't answer that question, then they attack you. I I've been right. exactly. <laughs> yeah. Did you realize that that absolutely none of you are experts? I realized that these no name people <laughs> on Amazon like Dalek Master and uh, uh, PJ Foggy and and some of these other people who won't give their full names and won't list their credentials, they're all the true experts. But right. You guys that have been published and have been doing this for years, you don't have the slightest idea what you're talking about. Well, I, I saw a comment on your um, radio site just before coming on air where somebody had wrote, um, well, Mara has written books, but mostly she's been doing tech editing, so what has she written lately? <laughs> and I, I just... <laughs> I just want you know the audience to understand that a technical editor usually ha- needs to know more than the author. <laughs> so just, well, just, just yeah. so they know that. <laughs> well, the other thing is too, and, and and Mary, you and I have had this conversation uh, privately before, but let's have it publicly. The one thing, and this almost seems to be a talking point that came straight out of the White House, is when you did the tele- excuse me when you did the press conference with Jerome Corsi in Washington D.C. The first. Uh, question you got from an Obama lover was, well, uh, you know, what do you know about Acrobat? And we've yeah. been hearing that over and over. Unless you're a certified expert in Acrobat, not that one has come forward to support uh, their position, that you don't know what you're talking about. Uh, speak to that. I mean, do you have to, in fact, I want to hear from all of you on this. Do you have to be an expert on Acrobat to address these issues with the, with the birth certificate? Uh, not necessarily, but but that doesn't mean I'm not an expert on acrobat. The the other thing too is the whole you know um, the, the people that are certified that come out and say the same talking points as the left, which go, falls into the wishful thinking category. You know the certification process. I just like people to understand is not necessarily an indication of experience. Um, you know, the certification uh, process is... You mean Adobe some, certification, correct? Yes, Adobe certification is usually just somebody that's a good test taker. And, and if they have the program and they have the help file and they have the money to pay for the certification process, you know, uh, it doesn't take much to become a certified expert. Um, what I value is experience, and, and I do feel I have that. So, you know, that's as far as I'm going to address it. <laughs> Anybody else want to chime in? Oh, I'll, I'll take a crack at that. Sure. The, the, the first off, this document wasn't produced on Acrobat. Okay, we know that from the metadata. So uh, anybody that wants to go there, you know, um, sorry, that doesn't wash. Why doesn't somebody tell us exactly what software was used to process this document? Because the metadata has been stripped. Now, why would you do something like that? All right, but that's that has been done. I mean, it's factually, the, the fact of the matter is, it's gone. The only metadata that you can find is a tag from a, from a piece of software that ties to an Indonesian company that's part of, of Quartz, which is part of the Mac operating system. All right, but that's the only tag that's in the metadata. So uh, how did this document come to be? I mean, I, I know where it didn't come from. If I take, you know, if I take a, a, a piece of paper and scan it in my brother MFC that's sitting here, it's, it tags it with the make and model number of the machine that performed the scan. <laughs> right. I'll take a crack at it too. The um, when when I look at the document, I don't. It doesn't matter what software generated it. There is a product. There is a a a, a a precise definition of PDF format. The, the 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 entire presentation in PDF is an acknowledgeable referenced thing. It doesn't matter what software creates it. Uh, what matters is this is something we can all look at. The second thing is scanners still have a physical, a physical limitation to what they can do. They will produce dithered or, or uh, a blended colors on the boundaries between, between major color groups, and you'll be able to see those, and it does uh, uh, not have x-ray vision. So th- there are certain facets of this that where you can, where, I mean, I, that's what I did. I tried to remove the things that were, 
uh, in the way because someone could claim, well, okay, this creates layering. Okay, let's ignore the layering. Let, let's just yeah. look at the fact that there are two colors on one pixel. Well, there's a, well, there's another interest. Yeah, there's another interesting thing that goes with that too. If you look at the AP copy, and you blow that up in Illustrator and you look at it, you'll see that there's chromatic aberration, which is always present in a color scan. It is missing in the White House copy. Now, <laughs> if you can figure out a way to do that, given the physics of a color scanner and how the imaging device works, you're better than I am. Anybody have any thoughts? Yes, Joe Newcomer here. I have uh, also addressed that issue of the chromatic aberration in one case, and it's true. The chromatic aberration is always there, and you'll see it, and it jumps right out at you if you know what to look for. And it's, if it's not there, then that is a strong indication that, that there's something wrong, that that was not made from a scanner. Because that is, as, as the word has been used several times, that is part of the physics of how these things work. You can't change the fundamental laws of the universe to suit your convenience. Albert, you, Albert, you said uh, in your YouTube video that whoever did this was either a really bad forger or a true genius. Explain what you meant by that. Well, it's it's quite simple. Um, this goes back to what I was so many artifacts in here that make it look official. You'll find uh, in some of the groups it'll have random parts taken out, random parts left in. It's how it would look if it was compressed. But then there's also little things they leave like the amount of layers and the amount of groups there are. No, no compression software would do that. And when you look at, like the other people were saying, when you look at the metadata, there's nothing there. All you can find is that it was exported through preview and that quartz was used to encode it. And, I mean, any, any, almost any scanner in the world is going to leave you know, their digital footprint on it. They're going to say, hey, this is the company that did this because simply for publicity issues, first off, but second off, it's just a standard thing to do, and there's nothing here. It doesn't say what scanner scanned this on. Um, the fact that it was done in preview proves that it was put on by a scanner, so there was some sort of things that were scanned on, whether it was a signature or whatnot. It's really, it, it's so complex, because you can really argue on either side if you're an expert. You can argue points that make it look valid. You can argue points that make it look invalid, and there's really, there's so many details in here. It, the guy was either a genius or he wasn't. He maybe left a lot of mistakes, or maybe he did it on purpose even so Obama can get caught. I would like to jump in and just point out that I have duplicated the effect of that very jagged edge black text with the white halo effect and no color aberration by taking a low res Im uh, resolution Im image of the Nordic certificate, enlarging it, selecting just the text area, you know, doing a loose selection, a very clumsy selection, and, uh, and then trying to um, over sharpen it. And what happens is I get that same effect where I get a very jagged black solid color text surrounded by some surrounding pixels that are white. Um, and, and so it's my premise that that is possibly what happened there. Yeah, it's possible, but then you, you, know, you look at the, the, the artifacts that you have in the rest of the document. For example, the dates, the date stamps, um, which are in the separate layer and were not pulled back to black. I mean, basically what you have in the, in the Obama certificate is for those things, for those elements that are black, you have two things. You have, they were either reduced to entirely black and they're thrown in that one layer that contains all of the pure black image, or you have grayscale, which has pixelation artifacts, of the, for example, the last number of the bait stamp. Right. But the problem with that is that there's, but there should be chromatic aberrations that are visible in the parts that were left in grayscale, and it's not there. And the white fringing that you see around some of the, the stuff that's been pulled into the black layer is not there around that e either, so the chroma would not have been removed. Well, this is Tom. I can make a brief comment to that. I just went through the PDF document and looked at uh, those layers that were layered as, er, or noted as image mask. And all eight of the other uh, of the other pieces are labeled as image mask. And I've gone through with Illustrator and just using the eyedropper tool, you can look at the color. And there's only one color on each of those image masks. It's just not black. Right. So it is still a one bit per pixel image mask. It's just not a black. It's a gray. Yeah, it's so a gray. It, it, exactly. It's still still it's still quote black and white monochrome. Well, it's but it's not. not. See that's black the, and white. See that. The, 
that would that would make sense if the piece of paper that it was scanned on was white, but it's not. Yes. It's green safety paper. You can right. if you take an image, if I take a document and I put it in my scanner and I say this is a black and white image, I get no chroma information at all. All I get is grayscale. Right. Okay. But that's not what we have here. We have an image that is clearly a color image. <laughs> well, now we've got a problem because I can reproduce exactly what we're talking about here, provided I scan a black and white image. But this isn't a black and white image. <laughs> no, you're, you're correct. I, and I, I there's got, another observation I would like to make to a newcomer here. Uh, whenever you are working with certain kinds of images and you want them, want the backgrounds to be treated as transparent, you make them a specific single color, and that specific right. single color makes it transparent when you paste it in. And if you're seeing a background which is all one color, that sounds to me, and this is just, again, an observation based on how I have done constructed documents, uh, that uh, there has been an attempt to place something in there that wasn't there originally, and it needed to be transparent so that it would appear to fit properly with whatever it was being placed on top of. So that, that raises some questions in my mind about what's going on and why those artifacts would be, those precise artifacts would be there. Jill, let me ask you a, a quick question. A, a lot of people have criticized any experts coming forward by saying, you know, you don't have a forensic certification, you're not a forensic, forensics document person. Uh, you actually are. You've got your certification, do you not? Well, it, it's interesting. I have a certification uh, in forensic science and the law from Duquesne University, and that's because after this controversy, a number of people who saw my articles on my website called me and said, we're an attorney, we have here a document which we believe to be a forgery, what can you tell us? And in many cases, I couldn't tell them. But if I wanted to get a certification as a document expert, I would have to understand all the issues of handwriting because that's the only certification that exists. So you have to study under a certified handwriting expert and understand about pens and papers and inks and other such things, uh, essentially no different than they were doing in the 19th century, except we have more sophisticated tools today. But it's not what I do. What I'm interested in are the exactly this issue of computer forensic document examination, and there is no certification in that that I'm aware of. And one of the reasons that we haven't seen a lot of forensic people come forward is normally they like to have the actual document, and Barack Obama won't release that. Maybe Orly Tates will be able to pick that up on August 8th at 10 a.m., but if you're like me, uh, you probably think the smart money is betting that she's not going to get a copy of it. Now, uh, with the time we have left, I want to go to something Carl told me in an offline conversation. Hopefully you won't be upset with me, Carl. Uh, but uh, you had said that in some ways this document is kind of like a giant middle finger to the country. Uh, as I look at it, I see when I look at the uh, signature of the local registrar, registrar I, I see the, someone trying to phonetically spell out ukulele. And I can just imagine whoever the forger is having a bunch of drinks at the local bar with his buddies and going, those conservatives, they're so stupid. Oh, my goodness. I even put ukulele in there. Get it? Hawaii ukulele? They still didn't get that it was a fake. Uh, there are a lot of obvious signs that tell us the forger was, you know, like the X and the word the and the, re the bottom uh, registrar stamp. Uh, it just seems to me like they seem to be saying, yeah, it's fake, we know it's fake, and you can't do anything about it. Anyone want to chime in on that, Carl? Anyone yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna no, I'll, I'll take a shot at that. The, U the UK L we, believe it or not, is real. Okay. And we know that because we have other birth certificates of a contemporary period that have been posted up on the Internet, and guess what? <laughs> I, I mean, it, it certainly caught my attention when I first saw it, but then I, I was like, oh, you've got to be kidding me. That's too blatant. <laughs> and so, and actually, so I went and I dug up a couple of others, and, and, and sure enough, there really was a registrar by the name of U.K. Lee Lee. That's so. hilarious. Uh, well, I, I, and see, that just goes to show that whenever, even whenever something in the document is real, we point that out as well. Someone else wanted to chime in? Yeah, I got, yeah I, I was Tom. I, I've got one more item. Anybody... Uh, uh, take a look at just the clipping mask on that uh, on the on the document. I I find it rather odd that when you uh, turn off the clipping mask on the birth certificate, you see more safety paper. Why right. would why would a scanner clip off or or any optimization structure after that turn he off? Got it.
Hang on just one second. We're about to go off the air officially, so I want to say goodbye to all my listeners. We're going to go into bonus time, which we'll be able to hear each other, and those online can hear each other, but uh, you'll have to listen to the archives to get that. And with that, we are off the air, but we are all still on. We are still recording, and when people go in and listen to the archives, they'll be able to hear this. And probably 99% of my listenership is through the archives, so most of the people hearing the show are going to get what we're saying right now. Tom, go ahead. The, I find it a little unusual that the uh, clipping mask would eliminate some of the image when there isn't really a reason for doing that. Um, I, I don't have any idea why anybody would do that except to make it seem more palatable with a reasonable boundary, and that would be a manual process. I also find there are a couple little, a couple little darkened areas at the right margin adjacent to box 17B um, that appear when you turn off the clipping mask. Uh, anybody got a good reason for that to be an automatic part of the process? Which which uh, mask are we talking about? The the uh, the clipping path for the entire group. Yeah, like there's the yeah, I see what group. It, yeah, I see what he's talking about. There's the a whole thing. Right. There's a there's a there's a mask. There's a clipping mask for the entire document that's on by default. And if you shut it off, you get another. It it looks like part of another series. And there's a couple of dark marks. Um, very similar to the you know the two nine nine one that's visible in in boxes seven through fourteen. Okay. Um, On the outside like pencil, border. You, yeah, it looks like can... pencil print through. When you turn that mask off, they appear. Um, and in that, along with the the overlay, I mean, one of the things that that first tripped me off on this document is the fact that when you take a look at the at the distortion, the flattening, if you will, of the level of detail in the background. Um, inside the areas where they're, where the boxes are, it's rather marked when you look at it under magnification. And yeah. that should not happen if it was a single scan. On the other hand, if you had two documents and dropped one on top of the other, this is exactly what you would see. <laughs> so yeah, it's, that it's was quite that, remarkable, the difference. Yeah, that was one of the, that was, when I first started looking at this, when, when the file was sent to me by my friend and I looked at it, uh, and I and I said, oh, that's an obvious forgery. And what I assumed he had done was picked up the the square, you know, containing it, and tampered with it, and sent it to me, and said, ha ha, you know. And so that's why I I went and pulled the copy. And then wait a minute, that's bit for bit identical. What are we talking about here? Um, but yeah, the clipping mask is rather odd too. I mean, the, obviously the file's been edited. The question is for what purpose? And that, you know, the only way you're going to get to that is to have somebody go look at the original. I have yeah, a question. In this case, I think it was just uh, they were trying to create a presentation, and so the clipping mask was a natural last step, uh, and didn't realize, of course, that that would not be the result of a scan. Uh, <laughs> the scan would leave the detail in. <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah I think there's a person, lot of things they didn't think about. Go ahead. Uh, as a layperson, and I think I mentioned this to you, Joe, on the phone, uh, as a layperson, the first thing that jumped out at me when I blew this thing up was the number one and the uh, the number uh, six one one zero six four one, uh, it just it's so pixelated compared to the rest of the numbers. Do you have guys have an explanation as to why one number out of that entire group would be pixelated like that? Well, I know why it ha yeah I know why it happens in the software, but I but I you know I mean can I explain why it would happen in this particular instance? No. Sure. Go ahead. I mean, it basically, what's what's occurred here is that the, the one has not been picked up into the group that uh, that was compressed down to black and white. So there's grayscale there, and that's why you see that. Um, and that's essentially what the, what the difference is. Now, what what you don't know is whether or not that was dropped in or not. And it, it's certainly possible that it is, and that the the original stamp is the six one one zero six four, and then something else, and that was erased and then put in. And there is some evidence to support that in the background that's behind it. The problem is, is since that's in the background layer, since the one's in the background layer, you can't drop it out to see what's actually underneath it and to see whether or not something else was there and was changed. Anyone else have a comment? Yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, you know, because it, like you said, you know, it, they it, I don't know if they merged it with the background or if it was part of the background, which I I kind of doubt. But uh I do think my theory and and I can't prove it because as uh, uh Carl said it's not on a separate layer, but my theory is that it was dropped in as a separate item when it composited the document and they might have merged it with the background. It, this is Tom. If you zoom in on that one, uh you see other interesting artifacts near it. That is that the background safety paper is highly pixelated and is not really in keeping with the uh, 
safety paper in other areas. So right. right. That's it, that's it actually looks to me that this was that this was shadowed in, uh, uh, blurred in, if you will, to 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 create that. Uh, and they, uh, of course, when we talk about the rest of the layers being lifted off, uh, I don't think that was the case. I think at some point they had a scan of a black and white version of this, because of course the original birth certificate is black and white. Right. I mean, it, it's it's on regular white paper. So if somebody had some original documents to work from, they could peel that black layer off of a, a much easier document and then start working with getting rid of the artifacts they needed to get rid of on the copy of safety paper they had. Well, I, I'll tell you, my my playing around and my experimenting with, with the optimization function using my birth certificate and my daughter's as samples um, leads me to believe that what happened here was that, that that one was dropped in and then an optimize was run. Because when I do that with my originals, what I see is the same sort of damage to the background in the immediate vicinity under high magnification. It's not obvious when you just look at it, you know, looking at it at, at normal 100%. But when you blow it up, um, it is there. And it, it comes into place specifically because of the optimization path that's done with the, with the, uh, the compression artifacts that are left in the file. And so it's, and, and that I can reproduce quite reliably. But again, if, you know, if I drop something onto a background and then I, and then I run that optimization path, that's what I'm going to get. And so the fact that it didn't layer into the same place leads me to believe that that one was dropped onto the background layer as opposed to the, the mask that was dropped on with everything else. Right. And if I can throw in a little bit of what we talked about in the first part of the show, uh, one of the things that forgers like to do to cover their tracks is assume the numbers of dead people. Uh, we've seen that with the Social Security card. We had Susan Daniels on. And also, there is a theory out there floating around. There was a mother who delivered a child right during that same time as Obama was born and the Nordyke twins. And there are some who are assuming that that one was dropped in because it takes it, it makes the number identical to the baby that died, and they knew there would not be a conflict with anybody else using it. So. Right. Well, yeah, I, I actually was listening to the first part of the show, and um, that's something that that I made some attempt to run down and was utterly unsuccessful in finding any kind of record. It would be interesting to find the parents of that child if they're still I alive. Think Jerome Corsi has, but uh, my private conversations with him would lead me to believe that uh, it was a long time ago, it was a painful memory for the mother, and she wants no part of discussing any of this, and she certainly didn't keep the birth certificate of a dead child. So I think we're yeah, probably well. not going to get anywhere uh, with that. But it is important to know that one child within that time frame, that very short time frame between Obama and the Nordyke twins, uh, was born, only lived a short time, and that that number might have been available. Again, I'm told, I'm no expert on forgeries, but I'm told that that is a common practice of a forger because the last thing you want is to have two people using the same Social Security card or two people having the same birth certificate number. So um, that's just a possibility as to why only one number needed to be changed. Right. Um, There's one other now. interesting artifact. Uh, this is Tom. Uh, sure. If you look at that National Review document, it kind of brings that to attention. The maximum thickness, if you will, of the National Review document is two layers. You have the black extracted layer and you have in uh, about a third of the document, you have an opaque uh, background layer. In the Obama document, you have three layers in places, because three of the, uh, of the uh, lifted pieces, or the separate images that are blended in, the NON and the two dates, are actually underneath the layer that is most of the, what they would uh, want us to believe is an extracted black. That's an unusual event in itself is to have that uh, is to have those layer to have those items layered like that and I I'm not able to do, to uh, to get that out uh, when I try to to scan and then uh, pull in using acrobat uh, pull the document out and get layers I was however able to get acrobat to pull out paths and I note that there are no paths extracted in this document there there are plenty of lines to extract and when I extract, when I take the birth certificate, print it, and then rescan it, and then run it through Acrobat, I get some paths pulled out uh, on, on occasion, depending on how, how the scanner went, what resolution I set it to, and so on. But right. not uh, the separate image layering. And that I find interesting, that there are no paths here. One of the things that Fogbo brings up 
is that the two boxes that are pixel for pixel identical, that the birth order boxes, right? Uh, they they claim that oh well that's you know a, a, a forger would do all three. I, to which I respond, well, how, how about if only one needed to be fixed? Right, <laughs> right. Well, that's only true if they had to actually change more than one of them. Exactly. Right. <laughs> so uh, the uh, and and they also commented that there is uh, that could be an item of compression. Well, of course, compression is if you take a large artifact. Compression is a very expensive process in terms of CPU time, scanning the document to find something that you can actually pick up and compress. And you know, there are certainly filters that will do that. Uh, do, does anybody find any evidence of that sort of large artifact compression going on here? I haven't found any yet, but I, I don't have all the tools I need to, to do it this. It seems that a lot of the letters also have, you know, a bunch of the T's and stuff, they're duplicates, pixel for pixel. Um, it almost does appear that the image was compressed, so I'm not going to argue that it wasn't. But I, I really it would be something you could pick out of the stream, yes? Oh, it, oh, it clearly I was. Oh, found the, it the image, yeah, the image was clearly. It, it's very highly compressed, and in fact, it was compressed at, at, to such a degree that it intentionally damaged the information that I would normally use to, to you know, to be able to determine whether or not something's been cut and pasted. Um, and and in order for me to reproduce that level of compression. I have to go to quite a bit of trouble in Acrobat. It's it's not the default by any stretch of the imagination. You don't get something that looks like this. Well, uh, normal compression. Normal compression is is uh, run length or uh, uh, being able to to identify adjacent pixels and do things like right. that. Uh, fractal compression more complicated than that certainly. But in this case, taking out two artifacts that are uh, in the in the uh, in this case the monochrome uh, mask and of finding those large and you know that large an artifact. I mean, there are many pixel rows, many pixel columns involved here. Uh, pretty much says there's a dictionary entry created for that item, and right. I I don't have the tool at present. I'm working on setting up a machine just to do this, but uh, I I haven't found the tool yet. Nor have I found I, mean, I haven't found any evidence that in the stream there is that particular kind of compression because that's not all that normal to do. No, it's not. And and the other thing, though, that that is rather interesting is that those boxes are not the only place where you find pixel for pixel identical duplication. Right. It's also visible in some other places, including some of the letters. And one of the things that I find most curious is that, from a typewriter perspective, typewriters never, well, for all intents and purposes, never produce two strikes, especially manual typewriters as opposed to electrics. Um, produce two strikes that are exactly identical even on the same piece of paper. It's just it's a mechanical device. It's, it's just the way it is. Well, they use a cloth uh, it, ribbon, too. Well, yeah. It, I mean, you know, Close the ribbon's light. in a different position. It's, you know, there's, there's all kinds of differences that lead to very small differences in the impression that's actually rendered on the page. And in, when you get into the typography, things get even more hinky because we know it was a bow typewriter from the typographical errors that are from the typography perspective that are on the page. It was not Carl, a selector. Carl, could you go into that? You did it when you were on the show before. But yeah, sure. Go ahead. Sure. The, the, one of the things that, that you can tell, you know, first off, the, the Selectric was introduced about two months before Obama was born. Okay, the, the probability of them actually getting them on a boat and getting them to a hospital in Hawaii prior to his birth is essentially zero. Nobody in their right mind would air freight heavy IBM Selectric typewriters to a hospital in Hawaii. Okay, But we also have the actual evidence on the document itself. Basket typewriters actually shift the basket of characters up or down to produce upper and lower case. So as a result of this, you will always have, if you have a misstrike, a capital letter will always misstrike high, and a lowercase letter will always misstrike low. It'll never be the other way, because it can't be physically. You cannot possibly have the carriage, the, the actual carrying component of the bow, move below the lower stop, and so you cannot strike a capital letter below the line. You can strike a capital letter high if you only press a shift key part way before you hit the letter. Okay? So, and the opposite is true for lowercase. So we know that that's the case. Well, that tells us a bunch of things. Because the carriage on a bow typewriter is essentially a spring-loaded device. It's got a clock spring in there and a, and a piece of cord that carries it back. And so it's always under spring tension as it moves. When they get worn, they get loose. And so they'll, you'll have, for example, position two will strike a little bit to the right of where it should because the carriage is a little bit to the left because the paws that position each position are worn out a little bit. Okay, well, that's great, except that if that happens then every column two on the document will be off to the right a little bit. 
not just some of them, but all of them. And so if there's a misalignment in column two in one place in the document, it should be present in all of them. The other possibility for character damage is that the actual hammer itself is bent a little bit to the left or the right, and that happens too, because the typewriters get sloppy, they're mechanical devices. But again, if the letter E is off to the right a little bit because the hammer's bent, all letter E's are going to be off to the right. <laughs> all right? So these consistencies are one of the things you can look at in the document. And if you look at the Nordyke certificate, you'll see that there are some of these errors in the Nordyke certificate, and they're consistent throughout the document. Everywhere where there is a misalignment of one form or another, it carries through the entire thing. That is not true here in this certificate. I so that's a major kerning. problem. So we have kerning. Well, it looks like kerning in some cases, okay? okay. But in fact, it's not kerning. What you're seeing is... See, normally what you would see when you have letters that run into each other's character space, that can't happen on a typewriter because the typewriter doesn't know what the next character you're going to type is. All right? So it doesn't have the ability to, to – it can't see into your brain. It's a mechanical piece of equipment. A computer can easily do this because it has the entire string of characters before it prints any of them. The, the thing is that with a typewriter, though, when you see this, the first, the first thing that springs out is that's computer-generated. But if you have errors in the unit, in the way it's functioning, because of where, you can have things that look like kerning but really aren't. The problem is they have to be consistent. And if they're not, then you've got somebody, that, that the document looks an awful lot like somebody took three or four documents from different machines, or at least from different parts of, of, of a page on one machine, and pasted all these things together. <laughs> and that's exactly what it looks like we have here. So it's not kerning, it's cut and pasting from multiple source documents. Well, it's, it's impossible to tell exactly what was done, but it is what is on the page is not consistent with a worn typewriter. Okay. And, and on the cut and uh, copy and paste uh, argument, you know, I mean, I realize that some of these uh, anomalies could happen as everybody's discussing with uh, compression and stuff like that. But from a common sense point of view, uh, the problem I have uh, with the duplication, like on uh, box C, D, and 7E, there's a yes and no box in both of those questions. Right. And the box C, D, the yes box has uh, that solid black uh, X, and 7E has the pixelated X. And the letters above it are also pixelated, which to me is a sign that they had to adjust those letters to compensate for what the original box was there looked like. The uh, box on where the pixelated is, the next, the no box next to it is empty. But right. those letters above it, where it says judicial, uh, that D and I are two examples where they're exact duplicates of other letters. Uh, the, the I above that box comes from uh, the, the I, the sm uh, lowercase i in, inside above it. And right. the D comes from the residence next to that inside above it. Um, and it, it, pixel for pixel, it looks identical, which to me signals that there's a possibility, I, again, since we don't know for sure what exactly was done to, to composite this document, but it's just my theory, um, I do want to emphasize that, that I think they took the D from the residence, the I from the inside, to cover up the fact that there was an X in that no box. Well, there's an, interesting, there's an interesting set of artifacts if you look at the, at the background inside the no box. Mm -hmm. And then you look below in 7G where there's a yes box that's empty. Correct. You'll notice that the background has, is damaged in the, in the no box. Correct. And, yes. and yet it is not in the yes box. And there's also several others where it is not as and, well and, now. And, the, and let me also point out, you'll notice the positioning of that no box, the one with the damage, is right. also closer to the line than the other box. Well, are. yeah, and that's a major problem because those forms are offset print. There are no errors on the original forms. <laughs> meaning, meaning that that wouldn't happen. Is that what you're saying? Well, yeah. The, the, the original okay. forms the, the, you know, that go in a typewriter, Correct. Okay, yeah. those don't come out of a laser printer in 1961. Right. Right. <laughs> those were <laughs> offset print by a print shop using right. hot type. Okay? Right. So, yeah, and, and the um, pixels of that definitely blur into the line, which means that you know, it's not the correct size of box for that form. Well, it just mean, it means that, that that area has been altered in some way. Correct. And, and exactly what's been changed, we, we don't know. But the thing that I do find interesting about that particular box 
is that the evidence of the computer deciding to to compress that and leaving compression artifacts is absent around the border, around the outside, up by the word judicial. And that should be present, um, again, from my own experimentation. That damage should be present there, the, the, um, the, anti, the aliasing, if you will, um, right. up into that word, if that was all done as part of the same thing. And this, this goes back to what I've been saying all along. It's, this is a, from my perspective, this entire thing is a probability stacking game. Okay. Correct. You can look at any of these individual things and say, well, maybe there's a one in five chance that this one happened, and a one in, you know. But if you if you can find ten of these items, and assign a one in five probability that there's nothing hinky going on with any one individual item, then there's a one in ten million chance that this document's not a forgery. <laughs> All right. right. And that's just simply, yeah, you know, that's just simply two tenths um, to the tenth power, guys. I mean, this is math. Mm -hmm. Joe Newcomer here. Um, one of the things, one of the reasons I went to the certification in forensic science and the law is I found myself talking to attorneys, and I couldn't speak their language because I'm a computer guy. And right. so this was an education to me, and I learned a number of principles. And one of them is fairly important, uh, particularly when one is being an expert witness, as I have been in many other contexts in my uh, field of software. Uh, falsus in uno, falsus in omnia, because... Attorneys like to use Latin. But what it says is if one thing is false, then everything could be false. Mm -hmm. And this is why when you watch television court dramas and they, they trip up the witness, they say, now, were you lying last Tuesday when you t said you had your oath, or are you lying today? And the reason right. is that there, there is an inconsistency. And as soon as you see any inconsistency, red flags go up, that this Correct. is not a valid document. It's not, it's, it's not the true and original copy. And, and what I'm hearing here is we're having a huge number of inconsistencies that different people have spotted different inconsistencies. And the probability, as pointed out, is very, very low. That these could all happen in the same document. And I think that's one of the important things is the philosophy of how uh, attorneys think is that if you start spotting fakes somewhere, you, you've got some serious questions about what's going on. When you get these inconsistencies, a, if this were a trial, whether a civil or a criminal trial, these, the presence of these inconsistencies alone says this document cannot be trusted. And that, I think, is one of the important questions that people have to face. If there's any inconsistencies, we've got a credibility problem here, let alone right. as many as you found. And, and I'd like to also just add to that uh, argument uh, that for whatever argument they put out at Fogbo or any of the uh, left sites, you know, no matter which argument they put out there, none of them have addressed the, the fact that the left margin isn't aligned if it was used with a typewriter, which I'm sure Carl could, you right. know, expand on. You know, when you look at the NORDAC do document, you look at the left margin, everything when you hit that, that uh, return to go back to the next line, Everything in the left margin starts at the one exact same point. It's a well, straight even, line. It's, it, yeah, it's worse than that. There's there's no tab stops in the Obama certificate. Everything's centered and all pretty. Right. Well, you know, <laughs> listen. This was it, it, in, when when President Obama was born. He was just a baby like every other baby. Nobody made his birth certificate super pretty because they thought one day he would be president of the United States. Okay, <laughs> That is just not a rational explanation, and I have yet to find anybody that has one of these magic DeLoreans with the 88-mile-per-hour time machine. So, <laughs> so as a result, I, I have to assume that what we have here is awfully hinky because, as, as my girlfriend pointed out, it, it, she used to use a manual typewriter many years ago. Um, I used to use a manual typewriter. I typed all my term papers on them when I was in high school. And you never, ever type column or data like this without setting tab stops first so that everything lines up in the different columns. And then on top of that, there's another issue that is, is potentially even more serious, and that is that there are a couple of lines in, in the text, including the one with the sex of the baby, that do not line up left, right with the rest of the text in right. the document. That's now, what I'm referring to, too. And it does yeah, in the now, 
Well, now here's and it, well, of course it does because it was put in the typewriter and typed. Okay. Right. Now the innocent explanation is that somebody forgot that line and then had to put the piece of paper back into the typewriter. Okay. This is the innocent explanation. The problem is is that the information that appears to be missing is the gender of the child. Now I don't know about you, but someone by the name of Barack is not a girl. And secondly, <laughs> one of the very first things you notice when when a baby is born is what gender it happens to be. <laughs> You're Carl. You could be onto something here. <laughs> Obama is actually a girl, which explains why no one can name a former girlfriend or anyone he dated. The whole thing, the marriage with Michelle, is a hoax. Uh, Frank Marshall Davis is the sperm donor. It all. <laughs> I mean, I just look at this. I, I, I look at this thing with the with with the alignment, and it's laughable. I mean, the one line that's out of alignment is the one with the gender of the baby. Give me a break. And, and I want to and I want to emphasize again. Every argument out there that says this could be legitimate doesn't address that issue. You know right. the, the alignment problem. So you Most know, how, of them are how, how did, in other yeah. words, how did optimization affect the alignment? How did OCR <laughs> affect the alignment? Well, well, and here's the thing: those people <laughs> who claim that OCR was involved, OCR leaves very specific traces in the PDF, and they're not there. Right, I understand that. <laughs> and, and if you've noticed, if you noticed, I think they've stopped using the OCR argument. They've they have. conceded that, that, that OCR was not used. <laughs> even some of the OBOTs that I've been arguing with on Amazon have conceded that OCR was not used, but it was a nice try. And right. what, they're, what they're doing is, and I think, Mary, you pointed this out in a private conversation, is that all these you know, pseudo experts who don't have enough confidence confidence in their position to actually give us their full name or even their first name. Or uh, even they like their expertise one, if they want to attack mine. That's right. Yeah. Well, they but they but they can back their stuff up. Don't you remember what the guy said? The difference oh, that's right. That's Mara right. He's going to he's going to write a point by point report, which I'm still yeah. waiting for. Yeah, so that's, that's in six weeks. <laughs> a guy on Amazon was going to write a point by point refutation of Mara's report, and we're still waiting on it. So, Kurt. Get busy if you're out there listening. Yeah. Also, but one group will say it's all OCR. The next group will say it's all about compression. And they, as you said, Mara, in a private conversation, they use that as the panacea for everything that ails this document. There is no one explanation that can explain this myriad of anomalies. Uh, I mean, am I off base with this, guys? No. I, no, I don't think so. I think the real question that we that we all have to ask here is, at what point do we start looking at this as what it is? You know, if I show you a glass of, of a liquid, okay, and, and I say, this is water, and I hand it to the guy on my right, and he takes a sip of it, and he spits it out and says, that's effing vodka, <laughs> all right, do you still believe it's water? <laughs> I mean, how many times do we have to go through this stuff with the, with the same crazy arguments? You know, all, all I, all I want to see is somebody take a birth certificate, their own, all right, throw it in a scanner and, you know, redact out what you want and produce – with, with nothing other than automated processing, a layering layout, a pixelation layout, a, a, a damage layout for the background that looks anything like what you see here. And then I want someone to explain to me how a document magically turned itself from safety paper green to baby blue in a space of three feet. <laughs> Well, no. Because I am not Harry Potter, and I don't think any of us are either muggles or magic, okay? <laughs> well, you know, speaking of colors, uh, someone made the analogy that if you went to an auction to buy a painting, and you were told that the painting was painted in 1850 or maybe even 1750, and you wanted to make sure you didn't get cheated, and you take the painting to several experts, and they say, you know, I don't know how to tell you this, but... Uh, there are some paints used in that painting that really weren't developed until the 1930s or the 1940s. <laughs> you probably wouldn't question whether or not the painting was a forgery, yet we're screaming at the top of our lungs to the, not only the mainstream media but the conservative media that this thing has evidence of, of parts of it being constructed on a computer which didn't exist in 1961, and nobody even wants to talk about it. Yeah, well, you know, this is one of the things that, I mean, I, as, as I have been saying since this entire thing began, this entire controversy can be solved in about 15 minutes. A, a forensic expert, all he has to do is take a look at the original page in the bound book, okay, in the pin binder, 
and take a cotton swab with a little alcohol on it, take a swab of the ink, and run it through a gas chromatograph. If it has not been oxidized and sitting there for 50 years, guess what? You're busted. All right? Then all I want to, then I want to see the, the negative from the microfilm, which was taken of these at some point in the past before these things were all turned into digital records, and I want that compared with that leaf of paper. That record is there. It exists. And then you compare that against the digital images stored in the current archive system. Those three documents should all match, and the first one should be able to be authenticated to be 50 years old. If you cannot authenticate that that piece of paper and the printing on it is 50 years old, it's a forgery, period. Right. <laughs> I would have a talk with uh, Doug ba uh, is it Vogt or Vogt or and also Paul Iray because they're going to be accompanying uh, Orly Tates on August eighth at ten a.m. when she, you know, assuming they're not closed that day when she goes to the Department of Health in Hawaii <laughs> with her subpoena. Now I'm going to be honest with you, folks. I don't think there's a snowball's chance in Hades that the Department of Health in Hawaii is going to turn this document over, subpoena or no subpoena. But if by some miracle they do. It would be nice to uh, make sure that uh, that Paul and uh, Doug do that. Well, if these if if these guys are actually competent forensic examiners, then you know I mean what she's got is a is a subpoena for production and examination. She's not going to be allowed to take it. She's not going to be allowed to do anything that would damage it. But you don't have to. You can you can examine it using non-destructive techniques and authenticate whether or not this thing is 50 years old. I mean, first off. Among other things, there are leafs in that book on both sides of it that are also 50 years old. And all of those are there. So right. it should be trivially easy to ascertain whether or not this, this you know, thing is, is actually, whether it has any chance at all of being authentic. I mean, look, if the, if the paper looks like it's three years old, we've got a little problem here, don't we? <laughs> yeah. So note to the Obama staff, get back to Hawaii and make sure that the birth certificate immediately before it and after it are modern-day forgeries as well. Oh, so gee, all of them, all of them in that book. Gee, that would be kind of tough, wouldn't it? That yeah, would be, um, what, maybe a couple hundred? Well, you would have to yeah. retype them, too, to make sure that the left alignment isn't, uh, you know, the same. Well, <laughs> except, that, except that the Nordikes were. Oh, darn. And that one we already have a copy of laying around. Yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to encourage all our listeners to help celebrate Obama's possible birthday on August 4th <laughs> by, by calling their, their congressman, calling uh, the media, uh, getting anyone they can to listen to them. And I would start with the conservative media because that's probably your best chance of getting well, any type of reaction. Without a document, we don't even know if he was born on August 4th because some uh, countries, don't they put the month before the date and some put the day before the month. So he could be conceivably, if those two numbers are, you know, the same uh, in, in reality and what he gives us, um, then April. he could be conceivably uh, April 8th, 8th, correct? Well, you know, funny you should mention that because I had Susan Daniels on earlier, who's the person who's been tracking his Social Security number. Uh -huh. And in his particular case, they associate that Social Security number with someone born on 8-4 and someone born on 4-8. So there is the European uh, date uh, uh, being used there, and also there's 1890, which is really kind of weird. Um, but the bottom line is, is that if you go, in fact, I'll send you this document after the show, Mara. You can see that both those dates, 84 and 48, are associated with Barack Obama's Social Security number. Again, as well as the year 1890, which uh, there are a lot of possible explanations for that that uh, Susan has uh, gone over earlier in the show. Uh, but but who knows? I mean, it's the day he's chosen to celebrate it. He doesn't seem to remember it himself because right. <laughs> three weeks ago, I think he said my birthday is next week. Yeah, uh, he signed which kind of odd. Yeah, didn't even know what year it was. I think he missed the year by three years. I could just see if Sarah Palin or Dan Quayle did that. But all kidding aside... Well, that's a, that can be explained by a clerical error, you realize. You know? His whole life is a big <laughs> string of clerical errors. Um, yeah, yeah, but let's but, be uh, honest. None of us know when we were born except by our birth certificates, right? Right. Or our mamas and daddies telling us so. Correct. Well, that's, that's, no, that's a good point. And, but, but, you know, it's funny because as I argue with these Obots on Amazon and other places online, one of the first things they say is, can you really prove you were born in the United States? And my, my, answer to that, my answer to that is, well, you know, as a matter of fact, I can because my mom is meticulous when it comes to keeping records. We've got the doctor's records. We've got photos immediately coming home from the hospital in, a, in, a, uh, in an apartment, actually, that I know 
is in the United States. We've got pictures with all the grandparents who've never had passports to leave the United States, and it's all taken place right after my birth. So yeah, I think with great confidence, I can say I was born in the United States. But with Barack Obama, there are no pictures at the hospital, at the house, mama holding the baby, grandparents holding the baby. All those things you normally see are absent in the case of Barack Obama. No doctor's right. records, no photographs, no nothing. Uh, it, very mysterious. Uh, you know, this is a guy that's used four legal names in his life. Yeah. Um, and, and Corsi and I covered that on another show. But the, the guy is just one big mystery man. So, uh, you know, just I guess we can just add all this to the list. Well, before we go, I just want to ask anyone, give anyone, I mean, we've got, I guess, 20 minutes of record time left if we want to use it. But is there anyone else on the panel that would like to bring anything up that we haven't covered thus far? Yeah, I think I, think I have something. Okay, and sure. I'm not I'm I'm not sure if anyone else has addressed this. This has to do with the short form birth certificate. If sure. you look in the bottom left corner, it says R E V eleven slash zero one, and I'm assuming that's just some um, form number, and all the forms printed with that number are going to be completely identical. Um, if you pull up other people's Hawaii Honolulu short form certificates, they have that same number. Uh, one example would be Corey Hideo, and then Patricia Da Costa. She was born in 1930, I believe. And they both say date accepted by state registrar at the bottom. But Obama says date filed by registrar. There's no state registrar or accepted. And if you, um, if you Google Alan Booth and you get his short form certificate and look at the bottom, it says REV 10 slash 05, which is a different form number. It says date filed by registrar, which could only mean either the document was pieced together or a standard form that's one serial number that's always the same on all of them somehow got a different field put on the certificate that didn't exist at the time. Hmm. Yeah, I, I think hmm. it sounds to me, and, and, and it's just theory again, you know, because like this long form, you can only you know, speculate without really knowing uh, what went on. But it sounds to me like they started out with the uh, a current form version and then it probably uh, altered the form version to be consistent with that date and time of 1961, but forgot that you know other language was probably changed when there was a different form number. <laughs> so once again, not a very good forger. Yes, yes. <laughs> Speaking of that, you know there are these little doodles all over the thing that are driving me crazy, and I, I, I really think that was put on there by the forger just to drive me nuts personally. But uh, if you look in the A in Alvin T. Onaka down at the bottom, it looks like a smiley face, but it's actually a letter E. Uh, if you look down the side in, in boxes 7G, 9, 12B, and 14, you've got the number 2991. Uh, There's little doodling in box number... Um, Three, you've got those X's up there, and what's what's ironic is that some of these, or what's interesting rather, is that some of these doodlings appeared on forgeries that were released many many months ago, and I think it was Dr. Corsi who pointed that out to me. So we have some known forgeries out there that were released, and pardon my language, I know we have a minor on the line, but they released them because they said they wanted to quote unquote f with birthers. So they release these fake documents with these mysterious doodles on them, and then the White House releases this electronic version, and it's got some of the same doodles as some of these fake ones that were released many months ago. Uh, I mean, the whole thing just seems like someone who's so cocky, so overconfident, that they think they can, you know, pull a fast one on the United States, or that they've got the media, the state-run media covering for them, and that they can do whatever they want with impunity. I mean, what do you guys make of these little doodlings? Well, I'll, I'll tell you, one of the things that I thought was very interesting was that, uh, you know, one of, when, when I started going after this, um, it didn't take long before people, I, I got five or ten copies, and I'm, I'm convinced it was an organized attempt um, of the supposed Kenyan birth certificate. Right. It's been floating around on the Internet. And, and these were people, I know, I know he was born in Kenya, I know, you know, this is, of course, what they said in the email. Here's, here's proof. And it took me about 15 seconds to look at it and say, that's a forgery. <laughs> and so, you know, you have, to, you have to look at these things and you, and you say, wait a minute, you know, what sort of organized little campaign is going on here? Because there's a game being played, um, and it's, it's not just the obvious one. There's, there's a lot of little backstories and twists and turns. It's, it's very reminiscent of all the stuff that went on with Clinton and the Rose Law Firm, you know. 
And and so you, you got to you know this is this is not unique to democratic politicians. It's kind of a generic thing any time that a politician gets caught with his hand in the cookie jar there's always a bunch of people on on you know their side of the fence so to speak that try to play games to discredit people and and they'll throw things at the wall see if you'll bite at it so you do have to be a little bit careful that there's you know there's, there's been a number of other things that have been sent to me i know you and i have discussed this offline um some of them have debunked and have said you know look this is you know yeah, okay maybe it's a little hinky but it's not proof of a forgery which is what this person has been asserting well, now, Mary, you came out and said the Kenyan birth certificate was fake, did you not? Yes. Uh, you, you talked about the one that uh, Orly had originally released? And yeah, that was the yeah. one that the Fogbo site likes to brag that they did. Yeah, and one no, of the things I, I told them in an email is you didn't fool everybody because Mary Zabest came out and said it was fake. Yeah, in fact, but, in fact, that was another time when uh, everybody, you know, that I know that, uh, you know, does, does want to uh, expose Obama, you know, his uh, fraudulent uh, behavior and, and stuff, uh, they jumped on that. And I was one of the first to say, you uh, know, wait a minute, this looks fake to me. You know, this looks like it's, it's an attempt to kind of get you to jump on it and then make fun of you. Um, and, yeah, I could recognize that that was a fake right away as well. Very good. Uh, anyone else have anything before we go? Uh, Joe Newcomer here again. Sure. Uh, I have had the opportunity to review many other documents, uh, which is part, again, why I went off to get a certification on understanding the law. And I have found them all quite amateurish. That is, I don't think there is deliberate attempts. I think it's the fact that many people who think they're pulling something over on you just don't really understand the subtlety that an expert can bring to bear to demonstrate that there is something wrong with the document. And therefore, they don't know that they're going to get caught. And I've seen this many, many times. Mm -hmm. And it, it's really... You look at, and you just look at some of these forgeries and you laugh. How could anyone in their right mind have believed that this document was authentic? Or more to the point, how could anyone in their right mind think that anyone would accept this document, which is so obviously wrong? But it's funny. It's only obviously wrong if you know what to look for. Right. Well, that's, uh, yeah, the thing is, is it's actually fairly difficult to, to forge something like this, even in an electronic format. And, and do it in such a way that if you've got people diligently looking for evidence, that they're not going to find it. And, and, and I would agree with uh, that assessment about, you know, I honestly, I've met a lot of people in my industry uh, that have had a couple courses in, you know, Photoshop, Illustrator, whichever program we're working in, and they automatically assume because they know enough about the program to maybe get something done for the job that they're, they know enough about the program, period. Right. And, uh, you know, that I've seen so many people that consider themselves experts. And you know, I, I always pull out an expression my mom once said, you know, a, a fool is one that thinks he knows it all, and a wise man knows what he knows not. You know, to me, I, I've been working with these programs for a long time, and I will still not claim that I know everything about the program. It is so deep. There is so much to know that as much as I do know, you know, there's, a, there's still a lot to be learned. And, but these people, you know, didn't even have a fraction of what I knew and considered themselves experts, you know. And now they all have nicknames and they're on Amazon making fun of <laughs> yes. And they're making Obama's birth certificate. <laughs> Absolutely. Let, let me throw one thing at you because this comes up a lot. I know that one of the first things people look for when they look at a forgery is a misspelling. The, down at the bottom, the registrar stamp, Alvin T. Onaka, there's an X in the middle of the word the, where an H should be. Uh, compression, OCR, or just failure to spell check? Mm, that I don't know. I honestly, you know, am not sure on that one because it could well, be one, of all three. <laughs> well, you know, here's here's part of the problem with that that particular issue is that that part of the document is is an individual layer. Okay, it, if if you deselect it, the entire thing disappears, and then you got the funky thing that looks like a smiley face in in Alvin's name. Mm -hmm. um, the problem I have with this is, is a scanner error, if you will, which would be the innocent explanation as opposed to it actually being an X, is the fact that the vertical parts of the letter H are missing on both sides. Yep. Correct. Now, I can believe that there could be a problem with the scanner 
provided it was consistent through some other part of that line of scan, but it's not. <laughs> and I'd like to point out something else. The letters surrounding it are kind of odd and different than the other letters of the yeah. line above and below. And and the F has uh, on the word of right before the. Right. It has like different color pixels, kind of sort of where the F would have a separation of two horizontal lines. You know. Well, this is this is the thing that that stamp that I certified this is a true copy. La la la. That is probably an ink stamp. Okay. With with everything except his signature, and so you know there's a stamp pad, and you stamp it, and you stamp it on the document, and then you sign um, in the in you know in the appropriate blank. So Actually, it's possible. Actually, his signature's on the stamp. That's what I was thinking. Too. Well, it very well it very well may be, be part but, of it. Yeah. Yeah, it may be. So I mean, I can buy that maybe there's you know bad ink coverage. I mean, there's there's there are innocent explanations for what you're seeing there. Okay. But uh, boy, oh boy, does that look bad. <laughs> yeah. Well, thus far they haven't pulled another document from Hawaii that has that same misspelling. And or again, the happy I would face. Yeah. I would challenge anybody to run uh, a Hawaiian birth certificate or anything through his, well, specifically the ones that have his stamp on it and produce an X there. Uh, I have another I, I question just, about that stamp, though. What's that? How come it's basically exactly in line with the printed lines on the document? See, the yeah. printed lines are on the previous document, and the stamp is, parallel. On, is on the copy, and yet it lines up. See, I'm looking here, and dang, it just looks like it's perfect. I'll tell you what, I'll, 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 have, to, bit. I'll have to take a look at that, and, and you know, I can, I can pull some, uh, you know, some parallel tests on that and see whether or not, in fact, it is. It does look like it at first blush. It appears to be actually just uh, paging down here. Boy, that does, well, it's really close, but it's not exact. Well, let's see. I'm going to create a line here. I got a little bit of an error here looking at it on my screen right now. I'm just using the top boundary of the of the margin as my reference point. I didn't actually, uh, you know, pull a, pull a line segment with a with an angle on it. But uh, well, what, 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 what do we think? Uh, I'm not sure I'm understanding the question. The, the box, the, the, the um, certification area, um, the, the comment that was made is that it appears to be exactly lined up with the actual document, and that would be almost impossible to do manually if you were to stamp a, a piece of paper to get the, you know, to get the, the alignment exact. Uh, you mean perfectly no, horizontal? Yeah. It's, 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 yeah, it looks like it's too good, but in fact it's really not. It's, it is off a little. Okay, Not much, but, but, but enough. something that wasn't off. Did everybody read the uh, article about the signature uh, being exactly one pixel from the bottom of the uh, line? Yeah, there was. Yeah, I I did a little bit of work on that. Um, there is a there is a problem that is fairly evident here with with um, Stanley and Durham Obama's signature. When when you look at the if you take a baseline and you draw it on that uh, on that signature you'll see that that signature is essentially each of the words in it um, has no vertical error in it whatsoever. Now, <laughs> I don't know about you, but unless, unless Stanley Durham um, was a trained calligrapher and, and took her time signing a piece of paper, which she probably did under duress having just given birth to a baby, uh, that's pretty darn hard to do. I couldn't do it here with a with a drawn line and a piece of paper and get uh, get anything close to that exact and and actually the other signatures on the document including the registrar and the uh, the attendant um, do have slight vertical baseline errors which is what you normally would expect with a manual manually signed piece of paper yeah and in fact the first uh, relatively pixelated uh, version that's uh, of the word and is does deviate substantially. It's the portions yeah. that are in the in the uh, total black image mask, uh, which is the U N H A M and Dunham and the right. then the full right. name Obama. Those are the ones that are seem to perfect. be rather perfect. Well, yeah. no, actually, it's it is it is actually if if you take and you draw a baseline on there, it is exactly perfect. <laughs> Well, the, the yeah. N, N on the N, yeah. The, the, A the, the, possi the, line, the possibility, yeah, yeah the, po the, 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 the ability of a human being to sign that perfectly is, is an open question. Well, tell us, uh, tell us data. Where, where would you put the odds on that? 
Star Trek <laughs> reference. Sorry. Go, go ahead. Go ahead and try it, and um, then run it through a scanner and see what it looks like to you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Guys, we've only got a few minutes left. We might be able to cover one more issue, and then we have to tell everyone goodbye. What? Anybody have anything left? Yeah, none in the uh, box 17A doesn't seem to line up with the rest of the characters in the list from typing. I don't know how many typewriters this went through, but it sure couldn't have been just one yeah. if it were typed. Well, 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 yeah, they, again, well they, had a, the, they had a typing contest where they put every letter in a different typewriter, you know, because they knew it was going to yeah. be special. <laughs> <laughs> so basically what we've concluded is, is that this is a genuine document. It's just that we had very perfect people signing, that multiple typewriters were used, and that they did use a 1961 IBM Selectric and manually kerned uh, because they knew that Barack would be president one day. Correct. Okay, just make sure I got it all. <laughs> and, no and compression and compression explains everything else. <laughs> uh, and if compression doesn't explain everything, OCR does. <laughs> That's right. So yeah. all bases are but, covered. But there's only one explanation. Whatever it is is good for everything, except the things they don't want to talk about, like the left column not lining up and all those things. Well, that, yep. that, that, that happened in the typing contest. <laughs> Absolutely. I don't know. Uh, I've I've often heard that old line. Someone's trying to uh, you know uh, express extremely low odds of something happening, and they'll say the odds of that is the same thing as the odds of putting six monkeys on a typewriter and have them all randomly type out the complete works of William Shakespeare without an error. So <laughs> I don't know if we had to train monkeys on this or not, but this is absolutely uh, this is absolutely amazing that not one major media outlet will look into this, not one public interest law firm will look into this. Even our friends in the conservative media, you know, poor Jerome Corsi, he had interviews on major networks cut at the very last second uh, when he was supposed to do interviews with some major uh, names in the conservative broadcasting business, and it's just absolutely ridiculous. I have never seen the nation collectively bury their head in the sand uh, the way it's been done on this particular issue. I mean, it's absolutely embarrassing. Uh, you know, we had people like James Rogan back during the Clinton impeachment who knew full well that he wasn't going to be reelected for going after Clinton because Rogan was from California, Clinton was popular in California, but he was willing to sacrifice his political career. And we don't have those types of brave people anymore. We have, uh, you know, as Susan Daniels was saying, a bunch of cowards out there. Uh, absolutely amazing. But hopefully everyone listening to this will be convinced that this is a document with many problems and will demand that our leaders in Congress will launch a, an official investigation, get a hold of the actual document, and do the types of tests that Carl is suggesting, which would put an end to this within a few minutes. Yeah. So uh, hopefully that will happen. And again, we want to encourage everybody to call their congressmen, call their media people, and get the word out on this. Uh, I thank all of you for being here today. Uh, maybe if we can get some of those obots to actually use their real names, we can have a debate. <laughs> Don't hold your breath on that. Uh, you know, but maybe we can get them on and have them explain how OCR explains everything. But uh, to each and every one of you, uh, you know, Albert, I fully expect to be reading your name in the Wall Street Journal one day if it hasn't already been there. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Joseph, Tom, uh, Mara, Carl, all of you, thank you for being here today. I think thank this has been the us. most, certainly, this has been the most comprehensive discussion uh, that's ever taken place on this uh, document uh, by people who truly know what they're doing. So thank all of you for being here, and I hope we'll you. have you all back one day, and we'll have a little celebration party online once the truth is exposed. That would be great. <laughs> Fantastic. Thanks much. Uh -huh. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Happy to be on with you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. You've been listening to the Tea Party Power Hour with Mark Galar, a production of the Conservative Broadcasting Network. The only people who don't want to disclose the truth are people with something to hide.